and we are live hey everybody hope you're having a great day today this is going to be a super exciting day for us um welcome to the very first ever 2021 high altitude balloon challenge um and we are joined by us by an extraordinary uh guest today and actually call we go right after the the gittinger cup and um so let's bring in colonel joe hey colonel joe how are you i think somebody has to unmute you on your side and then you're ready to go how are you i see you talking but i don't hear There we go. I think we got you now. Good morning, Good morning sir. How are Bob. you today? Great. How are you, Bob? I'm doing fantastic. Colonel Joe, thank you so much for a couple things. Once for all, uh, everything that you have done for us um, and for the, 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 the Colonel Joe Kittinger Cup, um, obviously it's got your name on it. I want to welcome everybody, first of all, that are watching from around the world, around the United States. Welcome to our live stream. We are going to be talking with Colonel Joe. We have airplanes in the air. We have ground teams on the ground. We have drones flying. Um, we've got high, high altitude helium balloons going over 100,000 feet today. We're going to be tracking all of them. And um, so we're going to be starting the filling of the balloons in just about 15 minutes. Um, and though, for those of us in the production staff that are, we have people all over the country for today, I want you to know there's about a 30 second delay, it seems like, from the time that I'm talking live and the time that you're going to see it on the live stream. Um, so two things. One, I am tracking the chat history. So if you have any questions, any comments you'd like to make, feel free to put them in the chat. We can do some interactive questions. If you have any questions for Colonel Joe or myself or Stratostar, Feel free, put those in, and we'll try to get to those. Um, Colonel Joe, let me go to you um, to start off. And actually, I'm going to go to the wider view because you've got some cadets there with you. And I've got um, the young ladies a little off. There she goes. She leaned in. She saw the <laughs> she saw the video footage. Um, so, who do you have with you today? Well, I have I have five. Uh... Uh, CAP cadets representing the thousands of CAP students all around our great country and their their leaders are here and I really believe firmly in the CAP objectives and the STEM objectives and I support both of them because they are teaching the leaders of our great country right now and these are the future leaders of our country that that are represented here today from the CAP cadets that are here enjoying this event with me today. That's awesome. And, you know, since you mentioned all the great people, I want to give a special shout out to a few really important folks before we, we get kind of in the in the weeds of today. Um, first of all, we have to mention Dr. Jeff Montgomery. Um, he is the national director for aerospace education. Um, without his support, none of this would be happening. Um, we wouldn't have gotten um, the buy-in from National to to make this whole thing happen. It would have ended up just being a pipe dream in some of our heads. Um, and really, it was Dr. Montgomery and um, his his vision to allow this thing to kick off. So, um, you know, if anybody knows uh, Dr. Montgomery, give him a special thanks. I also want to give a special thanks to Susan uh, Millett. And um, Susan is in charge of um, educational outreach for STEM activities and aerospace education. And Susan and I, I tell you, Joe, we are basically like we talk every day. <laughs> for like the last six months, it seems like. Um, so to try to make this happen. And then behind the scenes, we probably have 20 plus people that are working uh, between the air crews. Um, like I said, we have two fully staffed air crews today um, that are going to help us out. Um, we have a fully staffed ground crews, a staffed, um, um, we call an SUAS, which is uh, basically a drone team. Um, we have a lot of folks that are out there to make this happen, including a company called Stratostar. And we'll be, we, we'll be meeting up with Jason in just a few minutes. Um, so we've got, you know, about five more minutes with you, Joe, just kind of for the welcome area here. Um, is there anything in special you wanted? We're going to come back to you in about an hour, but was there anything in special you wanted to kind of say to folks as a welcome? Well, no, but I'd also like to thank Dr. Montgomery and uh, Susan for their breaking this program, making it happen. And of course, all these wonderful CAP people that we are honoring today with the uh, experiments this, with this event. 
So uh, it's just it's just a great event that I've been looking forward to for a long time. But it's only made possible by people like Bob and Susan, and Dr. Montgomery, that, that made this put this together to make it happen. And the CAP, of course, is, is omnipresent by their being here with us and sharing in this event today. Well, the cadets do look great. All right, so I'm gonna ask the young man uh, to your right. We can't see the video and I wanna show this thing off. So for everybody online, show us off this cup. This is, a, when they said a trophy cup, I'm thinking, you know, like what you get for like your awards at school. This is like the real deal, man. Look at this thing. This thing is awesome. So- Well, it's a beautiful trophy that, that Susan uh, acquired. Uh, and this is going to the winning team of the science experiments was the 650 science experiments on these two balloons. And the winner, overall winner, that produces the best experiment will get this just trophy. And uh, I'll be there to present it to them, along with an honorarium. I'm, I'm giving $5,000 to the winning team for their efforts in making this the success that it is. But this wonderful trophy will also be going to the winner winning team of the uh, science experiments. That's awesome. Um, and so for those of you that are watching, you may not even be involved in Civil Air Patrol. Part of today is gonna be to give you a little taste of some of the stuff we do at Civil Air Patrol. Um, and I was joking with Colonel Joe prior to us uh, starting going live that uh, you know the hockey players, they have the Stanley Cup. And um, I think I think the, the the Joe Kittinger Cup looks better than the Stanley Cup. Um, so <laughs> so I this do. thing looks awesome. I do too. <laughs> All right. Well, Colonel Joe, we are gonna um, let you guys go for a little bit. We're gonna be back with you after we launch the second balloon. Um, so that should be somewhere around 1145, 12 o'clock. I'll be uh, texting uh, your, your, your staff there on site. It's always great to see you. It's always great to see our cadets looking sharp as always, all of you. And um, we will be back with you in about an hour and 15. So go get some breakfast and uh, enjoy the live stream as well. We'll be back with you. Thanks so much. We'll be talk to you in a few minutes. All right, that's awesome. All right, so here's what we've got for you. So in about five to 10 minutes, we'll be reaching out to our on-scene folks in Anderson, Indiana. And um, they have, I don't know if they're the largest at this point, but at one point they had the largest squadron in America, um, several hundred cadets. I think it's like 350 or something like that cadets. And they're actually looking to expand that um, uh, in, in getting more grades involved. So they're gonna get even bigger. Um, we're gonna be talking with their squadron commander a little bit later as well to see what does it take to run a squadron that literally is a school. Their school is a squadron. Um, and so a couple things I wanna work you through. Um, let's see here. Number one, here is our schedule. Um, we have 21 minutes right now, the countdown clock is rolling. Um, and we have uh, 1030, we had our welcome message at 1045. And all these times are gonna be in Eastern, if you're another part of the country, um, these times are all Eastern. 1045, we're gonna start filling the first balloon. Um, at 11 o'clock, we're gonna be launching that first balloon. Uh, 1115, we will um, start filling the second balloon and then we'll be launching that. And then we're gonna go back to Colonel Joe and we're gonna talk to him a little bit more about um, high altitude ballooning, um, the work that he did um, with NASA, with the military. Um, and then we're gonna get a tour of the mission base. Uh, what's kind of neat about this is this is actually a full run mission base. Um, we have an incident command post, we have a mobile mission trailer, we have a communications trailer, we have two airplanes, we have ground team, drone team, um, and we really wanted to kind of roll all this to you. Now, unfortunately, well, fortunately and unfortunately, this is an actual Air Force assigned mission, what we call in CAP an AFAM. Um, now, because of that, we're not able to actually live stream to you from um, the actual airplane. We can't live stream from the van um, because of the rules, because let's say if this was a real mission, something bad could be seen on the video. And so there's regulations in place that say we can't do that. But fear not, all those teams have people with cameras, including the airplanes. 
and they're going to be taking lots of footage for us and lots of video for us. And after the live stream, probably a couple of days, maybe a week or so after this live stream, there'll be another video. And it's not going to be a live video, but there'll be another video that we'll record for you all. And it's going to have all the footage from those teams. Um, so what we're going to have is two things. We are going to have, if you look at above my face here, um, you see a map. And I'm going to see if we can show the airplane taking off yet. Um, all right, so already show completed. But one of our aircraft already went today. As you can see here, this was the track as they moved the airplane um, from one location down to Anderson, Indiana. Um, and then we have another, they're gonna be the airplane that's gonna be circling um, the balloon launch location. And then we have a second airplane that is going to be um, taking off a little bit later. And they're gonna be hovering around where the balloon is coming down. The goal is gonna be two things. One, if they can see the balloon coming down, they're gonna to try to get some video of it. Chances of that are relatively slim. This thing is only about six feet wide. They're gonna to have to stay a, a couple miles away from it to make sure they don't run into it. Um, and so they're probably not gonna see it, but what they're gonna be able to do is they're gonna go around the location of where the balloon lands on the ground and they're gonna initiate a search, a search mission. Very similar to how Civil Air Patrol does search and rescue uh, across the United States. It's one of our primary emergency services roles. Um, and then once they think they have it acquired, we have a drone team that's gonna go up and try to get closer to it to help direct and guide the ground team. Um, so very cool stuff. Now, um, on our side, we are going to have um, a balloon tracker. So on the balloon tracker, we're gonna be able to get pretty close to within about a minute or two minute delay. So it's gonna be pretty timely. We're gonna be able to see exactly where the balloon is. It's altitude, the temperature, the, the, the track across the ground. We're gonna be able to see all these things. So we actually have uh, an example from a previous launch. As you can see here, you will see the map with how the balloon um, you know, went across the ground. And then we can look at some data and graphs as along with that. So we'll be able to see lots of great information about our balloons. Again, we have two balloons. And so right above my face on this screen, I worked super hard on this. This was like my first grade uh, art project. <laughs> so um, we have our two balloons on the, on the bottom here. You know, they're on the ground, so it's green grass. And then we're gonna go up until 100,000 feet and we should be bursting the balloons about 100,000 feet. So that what's gonna happen is as the atmosphere gets less and less, the helium stays the same inside the balloon. So the balloon gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger because the pressure from the atmosphere is not pushing down on the balloon. And then when, just like how you would pop a birthday balloon, right? At your house and surprise everybody. The balloon, at hopefully over 100,000 feet, it's gonna burst. When it bursts, it's gonna have a little parachute. It's gonna basically just drop, right? There's no atmosphere really for the parachute to open until it gets lower to the ground. And this was gonna drop pretty fast. And then when it gets closer to the ground, the atmosphere gets up higher, the balloon will inflate, and it'll be dropping about 2,000 feet per minute, all right? So that is kind of what we're gonna to do today. Then uh, in between, when we have some downtime, we're gonna be showing the cadets um, and the squadrons videos that they created, their prep videos. And um, so with that, again, if you have any questions, uh, feel free, throw ahead and throw your questions in the chat. I'll be watching for them as best I can and we'll get you recognized. With that, let me give a call to Jason Kruger and see if we can get him on. One second, everybody. We are calling Jason. Hey, Jason. Hey, Bob. All right, I don't think I see, oh, let's see, let's get some video going. All right, everybody All right. say hi, lo, hello to Jason. Jason, right. say hello to everybody. Hey, how's it going? So can you help me with this? So go ahead. This you're gonna film me. I gotta get you, you flipped. Wanna, I get a, you wanna cut it? Okay, show me how to get you flipped. Uh, do, so, we are live. So, no, 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 flip yeah. There we go. Hold on. Okay, Bob, can you hear me? I can hear you. You can hear me? Yep, I hear you great. All right, great. So we're 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 we got the uh, we got the B teams going. We're we're getting going here. Got the helium set up. The boxes. Why don't you take a look at some of the boxes here on the live feed? So that's going out to all the people there. 
So now these boxes for folks that are watching that aren't involved, what happens is, is we actually had 50 milliliter vials and the goal was that the cadets had to come up with um, projects that they could fit into these 50 milliliter vials. And then these are packaged up in the boxes you see, and these are what the balloon is gonna be lifting up into the edge of space. Yep. Hey, Bob, I went ahead and activated the SATCOM. So if you could take a look at the, uh, the tracking page every once in a while and see if um, the data starts showing up. All right. Yep, we got it. I can see it up now. I see the marker on the map. I'm showing that to everybody. All right. So we got our first packet through the satellite. And um, can you explain a little bit why uh, we're not going to send that link out today? Sure thing. Yeah, so everybody that's watching this, um, above me, you see two sets of graphs. You see a graph um, that's got a map right now that's showing Stratostar mission control. And above that, you see a flight tracker for our airplanes. Um, and so what happens is we know that there's going to be a lot of you. We have well over 100 people already watching. Um, which is great and we're expecting even more as we continue on through the day and so if everybody tried to watch this from their own phones um, it may actually crash the system so what we're going to do is we yeah. are going to um, my little mission control here that i have here, here in south carolina we are going to um, track it for you and pretty much all of the screens i'll show this one we can pretty much see all the same information um, and highlighting uh, the balloon track as well as the airplane. Now, why is the airplane track cool? The airplane track is gonna be cool because um, in real time, we can actually follow along the airplane I, as it is following the balloons or it's hovering above the airfield um, or it later on when it's the, um, and then they can stand around going through want. and it'll be uh, circling the landing location. Um, Jason, do me a favor. When you're ready to say something, just give me a wave because I'm going to mute you guys. We're going to follow yeah, along the um, the video. Um, yeah, sounds good. Okay, just wave to loud. me when you want your audio back. Okay. All right. So we are going to mute them on scene just so you guys don't get too much background noise. Um, so like I was mentioning before, we have a relatively large team that's helping to pull this together. So um, it really shows, and there's, we got some of our cadets coming out there. Um, look at them looking sharp in their, their, their ABUs. So we want to do is we're gonna take about 15 minutes and we're gonna be filling up this first balloon. And I'm gonna be following um, the first airplane to see, cause they should be taking off very momentarily. Um, and I should be able to start tracking them. And, um, Let's see here. So, so Jason, how much helium? Now, the, the balloon is using helium, correct? Correct. So walk us through, why do we use helium as opposed to say hydrogen or something else? Yep, so uh, this is a lighter than air gas. So basically, um, because it's lighter, it allows, it goes up. So if we let a molecule go, it would just fly up into the sky. And so when we put it in the balloon, it takes the balloon and carries everything else up with it. And helium is a noble gas, so it's not flammable. And, uh, you know, the alternative would be hydrogen, which is, is great. It's the first element on the periodic table, but it's very flammable. And we need to have a lot more safety and, you know, distance between everybody here. Yeah, so if anybody has ever seen, um, what was it, the, um, oh, um, oh, mental freeze. Uh, <laughs> what was the big balloon? You guys can put it down on the graph. They had uh, the big explosion, like, way back, like, in the 1920s. Hindenburg. The Hindenburg, thank you. My mind yep. lost that. Um, so the Hindenburg explosion. So that you know that's a, one of the reasons hey, why we use helium and not hydrogen. If you guys hydrogen. are okay with it, they could stand at attention back there if you want them to. So, or whatever um, is attention, you know. Okay, can you come help me, Kentner? Right, we're gonna follow okay, we along got, with we them. We got the main camera crew. Will you go ahead and mute us? So we're gonna get going here. Okay, you are unmuted. Yeah, he's got the phone. Okay, 
Um, but just gotta give some directions here. Okay, guys, let me just give you a heads up, okay? So I'm gonna fill this thing up. It's gonna, it's gonna, you know, hang off this tank a little bit. And then when it's time for launch, I'm gonna go ahead and take the line. I'm gonna walk it down. And each one of you can grab one aspect of, of the payload, okay? And you just hold it, I'm gonna walk to you. And then I'll just walk and grab it and continue to go up as we launch it, okay? All right. Now, one of the other questions that yep. we've already gotten, this was a great question. Um, this is gonna be a question for me to help answer um, is, let me just find it here because I want to so give you- So I think they can sit up there. These guys are just gonna help me um, launch it. Yeah, but yeah, yeah. So um, Jason Unwin um, asked me a question. He said, any thought about future missions for AEMs, oh, yeah, AEX and schools, ACE, Oklahoma Wing, DAE? So um, Jason Unwin, so yes, absolutely, right? So a couple things. One, we are looking at doing this again next year. Um, we have to get approval. So if this is something you think uh, you know is really awesome, then you know let your wing DA DAE know, uh, have them communicate that up to national. This way national gets to see that um, there's interest out there for us. Um, also follow along yeah. with us throughout the day and then you can reach out to me separately oh. if you'd like, because like here in yeah, South well, Carolina, when you know COVID restrictions lift and we're allowed to, we're actually planning on doing a very similar mission uh, here in South Carolina. So this is actually kind of a cool thing that you can do um, at a local level, local level. Now, Jason there at Stratostar, his company actually, that's what they primarily do. He doesn't exist just for CAP, which I know probably doesn't feel that way for the last couple of days for him. Um, but uh, typically he's working with the schools um, and they're doing the, this project at the different schools. So hopefully that answered that question. Um, the other thing you're gonna notice too, is we do have COVID restrictions in place. Um, Indiana is doing significantly better than some of the other locations. Um, however, we are still observing uh, mask mandates when we're indoors. We're still you know, man, uh, looking at um, social distancing. So you're gonna see us really work hard to make sure that uh, we comply with all COVID restrictions uh, in, this, in this time and day of COVID. Um, and Roger, thank you so much for that. Uh, all right. Jason, have we started the, um, Great. have we started filling the balloon? Or are we still yeah, getting ready? We're gonna go ahead soon. I, I see, uh... The CAP aircraft is on station. Sweet. So they're circling uh, at a safe distance. And I'm just going ahead and uh, checking the 360 camera here. This one, uh, we'll see if we can get that to work. And we're going to start filling here in a few minutes. Great. And actually, I'm, I just pulled up the, uh, the track of the airplane. So we're going to make that full sc screen. So there we go. We can see that they took off from... No. Anderson Municipal Airport, um, AIB. Yeah, I can. And then yeah. uh, we can see their track here. They went south. Um, and yeah. then um, they are over here right now okay. at a little over 2,000 feet and about 120 miles per hour. So very cool. Yep. So we are getting the track on the airplane. That is awesome. All right, great. Okay, 360 cameras on. And again, as um, uh, what uh, Jason just mentioned about the cameras on, um, I know that from the video footage from the cell phone, it's gonna be a little grainy at times. Um, the audio is probably gonna clip a little bit at times. Um, that's just you know the technology that we've got to deal with. Um, but just know that uh, on scene, um, they have multiple cameras, 360 cameras. And one of the really cool, exciting videos I'm really excited about putting up is we're gonna have video from the balloon itself going all the way all the way up to 100,000 feet. And I'm going to, when we get access to that, I'm gonna be putting the whole video um, up online. So you'll be able to okay. watch the whole thing. Uh, we're all right. start filling this thing up. Great deal, all right. So we've got a 10.54 start time on the filling. Now, how much How much helium, if, if a team wanted to do this on their own, Jason, how much helium would be required for this size balloon? Uh, this is a big one. This is like professional level, so. Um... You know, we're looking at this is uh, almost to the full 12 pound max flight. So we're using 290 cubic one feet, uh, cubic feet of helium. But if you're doing a, your own flight with just a camera and a couple GoPros, maybe 100 cubic feet. Okay. 
So what Jason's saying is when it's him, he's not messing around. <laughs> he's going all in. Um, we can we can fly something a little bit smaller because we're not carrying. We're probably most likely not going to be carrying as much weight. Why don't you get on the other side? Because the sun is you're you're shooting into the sun. There it goes. Yeah, now, we're filling it up. It's gonna get a little bit louder, so. No worries. All right, look at that. We've even got a, We've even got some folks in the stands. Next time we'll see if we can get a marching band, but <laughs> um, they are called the Jets. Um, as you can see, they've got a, a, an image of a jet on their uh, bleachers there. Pretty cool. Now, a little bit later, we're going to talk to Colonel Joe again. And Colonel Joe flew in a balloon much, much bigger than what you're seeing here. Um, obviously, Colonel Joe's balloon had to carry a lot more weight. Um, interestingly enough, this balloon and the balloon that Colonel Joe flew will be roughly the same altitude. So the video that we get and the experiments that we're going to run will be about the same altitude as what uh, Colonel Joe's balloon did when he, when he flew. And as you can see here, if you're um, a local squadron um, and if you're interested in doing this, you do. This is not a massive balloon. You do not need, you know, ten people to hold it down. Uh, Jason's doing this on his own, and so this is something that is doable, even with a, a slightly smaller team. We have a lot of people because we're running this as a full mission. Now, while Jason's filling that up, I don't know if the person with the camera can okay. hear me. I want to see, can they glance up? Can yep. they see the uh, airplane? Uh, not quite yet. Okay. It's going to be a little bit more full, I'd say. Oh, there I we need go. another five minutes to fill, and then uh, we're all, you know, ten minutes out. So Very five cool. Five minutes to fill, five more minutes, and then give them the heads up. Great. All right, yep, thank you very much. Yeah, we just saw the cap, the cap airplane. I zoomed in on the map um, so we can see them circling overhead on the map. Very cool. This technology, yeah, there, oh, that's a cool shot with the airplane flying behind the balloon. I know on the live stream that's going to come across a little grainy. Um, when we get the real um, footage, uh, this should look a lot cleaner. And for those of you, we've got a lot more people that have joined the live stream. So uh, while we're filling here, just a good morning to all of you. Um, I hope that you're having a great day so far. That balloon is starting to get bigger and bigger. So we're getting ready to launch that in just about four or five minutes. Because we are live streaming and this isn't a recorded, if you have any questions for anybody, whether that's Colonel Joe, whether it's Jason from Stratostar, whether that's for our incident command post, um, if you have any questions, uh, feel free to post them into the the, uh, the the YouTube chat here, and we will uh, we'll get those questions answered for you. Now, Jason, how much bigger is that balloon expected to get? Uh, we might be a little bit more than half halfway. Okay. All right, so we got a little bit of time. So I'll tell you what, if the camera person hears me, go ahead and zoom in on our, our banner a little bit and um, uh, have our crowd give you a nice wave. <laughs> see, if, see if they see you waving to them. <laughs> so. Very cool. So we've got a little bit of a studio audience. And that's a wonderful banner for our first year. Very cool. All right. Hey, I see somebody waving at us. A couple people are waving. That's great. <laughs> so, all right. Um, again, you know, we are trying to, we're, we're, you know, each of those groups are individual families and the families are separated by six feet. So we're following COVID protections in the stands. 
So where uh, I got a question here from uh, Peter Terso. Where could you get supplies to do your own balloon launch? And I'll answer part of that question because uh, we actually were looking at doing this in South Carolina before I was even reached out to by National to say, hey, we're doing this balloon thing. Um, and uh, you know, I was super excited to get involved in this because we were actually looking at doing it in South Carolina. And so one of the challenges I had was actually trying to figure out where we could get the gas because if you go to Party City or a place like that, they would tell you that um, you know there's actually a shortage. And I don't know if there is still a shortage, but there was a year ago on helium. And um, but actually, believe it or not, the best place to go if you want to look for a place for helium and a place you can rent the tanks as well um, is actually a welding supply store. You do not want lab grade helium. Um, the helium you get from a, a, um, a, a welding store, a welding supply store, is it going to be the perfect helium gas you're going to use for the balloons. Now, Jason, if you're able to still hear me and you're able to talk back, where's a good place that you recommend to get the actual balloon? Uh, so there's a couple of different companies online uh, that you can get them. Uh, there's even some on Amazon. So, uh, you know, a quick Google search and you can uh, find those. And like I said, uh, you know, if you don't want to do the full mission, I think uh, I can help do a share mission for you and your school. We can do the same kind of thing. Uh, we do it twice a year. And then if you like to set up your own kind of Stratostar SpaceX program like this for your school or your big educational organization, you know, we can help you do that too. So uh, if you're going to do a DIY hobby thing, you know, a lot of good stuff on the internet. And if you want to do it as an administrator or as a school at a scale like this, I can help you out. Very cool. You know, Jason, just an FYI, because uh, you can't see the chat. Lots of folks are saying thank you, Stratostar, for helping with today. Oh, that's awesome. So lots of folks appreciative of your help. All right. Um, I, helium. All right. And um, I do want to say... Are we getting ready to launch? So we're not launching yet. I got to go turn on other GoPros. Okay. All right. So we got a few more minutes. Um, you yep. know, so to um, to Jason's uh, point. Yep. Good. Well, first of all, I want you all to understand that from a workload perspective, Jason isn't just coming out today to do this work. Jason is the, the president and CEO of Stratostar. So we're really honored to have him out here with us, as well as the fact that um, uh, he is, it's his company that has all of the online tools. So all the education programs, um, I see Rachel Mercer. Good morning from South Carolina. Um, I see all of the, um, uh, you are, <laughs> I love the, I love the chats. The chats are great. Um, so he has been active in this since I think February, I think is when you and Susan at national first started talking about this was way back in February. Um, and they've been super busy. I can tell you that all the questions from the AEOs that come in, um, okay, guys. Jason has Why been doing an incredible job and his, his team has been doing an incredible job being all his answers. And uh, pick, up, pick it up and then I'm gonna walk up to you and you can If it looks like your screen is uh, stuttering a little bit with the feed, um, that's that's just the limitations we have with the cell phone um, coverage in that area. So that's not a you thing. It's not a YouTube thing. That's the local area. It gets better uh, over time. Um, so let's uh, we're gonna quiet down and we're gonna watch. Than an airplane flies. And we're gonna you watch the, the, thin, the local scene. The blue scene. line of the atmosphere and the darkness of the sky in the middle of the day. We have 139 projects from squadrons all over the country and each one has 10 science experiments in it so we have hundreds of science projects that are going up we have a little uh tracking device that blue thing is going to tell us where it is and it's going to go all the way down south past 70 today and land somewhere in a farm field we have this plane it's going to help us out as well as some teams on the ground all right we're we're going to count down from 10 sound good all right, I need to hear it loud for the internet and for the plane so they know what's going on. Sound good? All right, let's do this. You guys ready? I'm just gonna walk down and I'll just kind of take it from you and then uh, I'll put it up. All right, you can just hold this on the top like that. Good. You're good. That's 360. So you guys are on on camera right now. All right, let's do this.
Hey, Michael. Michael, we good? Yep. Well, whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> we can see there the parachute. Yep, we're gonna walk it up. We got all these uh, projects here. This is half of it. We have a whole nother balloon going up. We have three cameras on board here. All right? All right, let's do this. And there it goes. There it goes. Bob, you got the tracking on that. We've All got right? the tracking. You give us some updates. I'm going to start getting the other balloon ready. All right, sounds All good. All right, guys, I'm going to get another balloon ready. That was practice. I got another <laughs> balloon. So you guys sit tight. We'll fill it up. I think you can get a little louder than that. Sound good? All right. Hey, great job, guys. You ready for the second one? All right. All right, so the, I'm going to mute you guys. Do me a favor, again. Jason. Just wave to us when uh, you're ready, and I'll unmute you. All right, sounds good. All right, great. Thanks. All right, so that is balloon number one away. And again, I know that the um, the video footage is a little grainy from time to time, and it's... Um, uh, you know, it, it has a little start and stops. Uh, unfortunately, that's just what we have with the cell phone. Um, we're, we're, we're asking a lot of it. <laughs> so, um, so that's why we're going to mute him a little bit. All right. So let's take a look and let's update our tracker. Um, let's see here. So we have our balloon tracker and we've got our aircraft circling. Now you can see the aircraft is widening out. Um, they're doing that because they want to make sure that they don't interfere um, with the track of the balloon. Now, the balloon itself is going to uh, go almost vertical in the very beginning. Um, and so that's great. So it'd be easy for the airplane to watch it inside the Now, the airplane is actually really cool. Um, they actually have a GA-8 um, in Indiana, uh, which I am so jealous of. Um, I wish we had a GA-8 here. Um, so a GA-8, uh, think of it like a much bigger version of a Cessna 182. Much longer, I think it can hold 11. I don't have one here, so I'm not that, all that familiar, but I think it's 11 people it can hold as opposed to four. Um, it can hold a lot more weight. Um, let's see here. And I want to saw somebody asked a question. Um, Okay, all right, great. Yeah, so we had uh, the first launch was officially at 11.06. They're going to get their um, their second balloon ready to go. Um, and yeah, you can see the airplane really is starting to track wider. Um, let me show that. Let's see here. There we go. Oh uh, yeah, so as you can see here, um, you know, the, the plane's tracking wider, so this way it, it maintains a safe distance from the balloon as it's traveling. Now, the, the airplane is going to try to, it, as long as they have it in sight, they're going to try to stay with it. Um, the balloon is going to be climbing at about 700 to 1,000 feet per minute, and that's about what the airplane can do as well. Um, and the airplane started off about 1,500 feet. Um, so they're going to try to stay with the balloon as it goes up, um, at some point, probably around the six, seven, eight thousand um, feet mark, they're gonna not be able to uh, stay with it. It'll get too high for them, um, based on the the climb characteristics of the airplane when it gets a little higher. I do want to say one special thanks um, that we have to give today. That special thanks is the Mother Nature, um, and I'm not kidding you. When you're planning this thing out six months, you know, out. Um, and all these people, all these teams, um, 
you know, we could have had thunderstorms and rain today. <laughs> so, um, so I want to give a special thank you to Mother Nature. Um, if anybody out there knows a special dance to do, you know, a special rain dance, uh, you, if you did those dances, great job. Um, <laughs> we have uh, literally a perfect, perfect day today for this launch. Um, so let's see here. Um, James asked, I may have missed it, but what kind of tracker is being used? Okay, so we have a couple different kinds of trackers. I'm gonna have Jason, once we get the second launch done, um, after we talk to Colonel Joe, uh, Jason's actually gonna be going into an area we call the pit. Um, and they have a camera there and microphones there, um, and they'll be on regular network um, internet. So uh, we should have better, um, better voice, better audio and better video quality um, from inside. So I'll tell you what, if I don't remember, please, please, please um, go ahead and remind me of that question about the tracker. He can tell us a lot more. And I know Jason can, even though we muted Jason, so he can't talk to us, um, he's hearing me right now. So Jason, just uh, as a reminder, when we get into the pit later on, we're, we're talking, um, go ahead and tell us a little bit about that tracker. Um, let's see here. Uh, I got some nice comments here. Thank, thank you folks for your nice comments. Um, it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a work of love. I can tell you I was up to about 3 a.m. last night trying, <laughs> trying to get things to make sure they work today. Um, so I appreciate those comments. Um, but I'll tell you what, it's, it's, it's a full team here. Um, every, you know, we had our, our on-site team, um, we're gonna get a chance to meet them a little bit later. They are very busy right now. They're coordinating the tracks with, um, uh, they're coordinating the tracks um, with their uh, mobile mission communications base, uh, communicating that up to the air crew. Uh, the air crew is communicating back. Um, the air crew is also under, um, under the guide that if they lose track of the balloon, that they are going to kind of peel away uh, relatively quickly. Because again, we wanna make sure that um, there's no chance that the balloon and the airplane um, you know, could hit. That would make this a really bad day really fast. Um, so so that we it, it's CAP, like most places, right? You always hear safety first. Um, we've had several meetings um, that have specifically talked about the, 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 the altitude restrictions and the um, where to fly. We wanna make sure that we're flying on the upwind side um, of the balloon. So this way the balloon won't you know, blow back into the aircraft. So all of these things that you know, looks like are just happening are through the hard work and the dedication um, through the entire team that's there in Indiana. Uh, you get to see Jason, myself, and Colonel Joe, and a couple of cadets, but there really is a large group of people there. Um, let's see, Lil John asked a question. What is the URL for the mission control page? Lil John, you, you might have missed it earlier. Um, we are not actually gonna give that out. And the reason why is because that tracking site can only hold so much, um, so much traffic, and it could actually crash it. So what we're going to do is we are going to, let me pull that back up here. Let's see, balloon tracking. Let me see if I can refresh this. See if I can get a current track. Oh yeah, I saw it. Um, I see it. So let's zoom in. There we go. That's already a current track. Um, so it started off, I think, let's see here. It started off on the red. So I'm assuming it started off on the green, right? Yes. So it started off on the green and it is now at the red spot. So we're gonna be able to track this balloon. The other thing we're gonna be tracking is, um, I'm interested in, I'll pull this up on the other screen. We do have, and you're not gonna see the balloon track overlaid with this. Um, let me pull this up here. Um, this is the location, let me pull this up. Um, clear that. I got my old flight still in there from last time I flew. And let me pull in this. So this is the airport. So let me close that. Make this big for you all. Um, so one of the things that we had to do, and I'll show this to you because it's kind of neat. Um, let's see here. I want to show the... Uh, where are we? Okay, great. Um, so Anderson Municipal Darling Airport. Um, one of the things that'd be kind of neat, check this out. I don't know if you can see it on your screen. Um, you go to the NOTAMs. We have a NOTAM in here for AID Airspace Unmanned Free Balloon. Um, starting at 11 o'clock, 
and we have a window that goes till 2.30. Now we're gonna be able to, actually, hey, that was actually a really good time for your question, uh, Ted. Uh, Ted actually asked, do the balloons carry temporary registration with the FAA? And so actually that's what we're talking about right now, the awesome timing for that question. Um, so, so what we do is we actually open up a NOTAM with ATC. So ATC knows this is happening. Um, we also communicate with the tower. Now we usually don't have to communicate with the tower because we're usually outside. Now that being said, for this launch, if we look here, this is a class D. So if you can see it on your screen, um, I wish I could show you my fingers here, but um, there is a blue dashed line going around this airport. You can probably see it better there. And so this is a class D. Now you see the number is 34 there. What that means is that air traffic control controls the airspace between the ground and 34, 3,400 feet. Um, and so because, and they do have an active control tower between the hours of seven o'clock and 6 p.m. Um, so the launch for here is actually in the bottom left. Now they're not gonna show it because they're not tracking it that way. Um, but in the bottom left, um, we were actually launching inside of class D. So one, we wanted to file a NOTAM so the area knows that there's a balloon coming up through the area. We wanna make sure that there's no 737s that are gonna run into it because they're not gonna be able to see this thing from their windshield. Um, so air traffic control will let them know where it is and give them an advisory uh, to steer around it if they have to. So I apologize if you're in a 737 and you're flying through uh, Indiana and all of a sudden your pilot comes on and goes, ladies and gentlemen, we have to divert for a balloon launch. Um, we do apologize, <laughs> that's us. Um, so, so that's the class D, let me go back to the flight tracker here. Great, and we can see here they have, looks like they have bailed out to the west, uh, which is exactly what we wanted them to do. So fantastic job. Um, all right, let's see here. I think we lost our call with Jason. Let me go back in, I'm gonna call him back. and hopefully we'll get him back. And then we'll get to some of your questions while he's filling up um, the next balloon. And let me click over to the balloon walk tracker. And hey, that's kind of cool. The, the first balloon tracker, um, the balloon has made a sharp turn. Look at that. It got to a certain altitude and it's, it, it almost turned 180 degrees. Um, you know, probably what, 100 degrees there? 110 degrees it turned on us um so that goes to show you when you get to different altitudes um you know the wind shifts on you that's one of the things is if you're into aviation pilots have to work on quite a bit and so i think we're getting jason back Let's see here uh jason i'm not getting any video from you if you're sharing um so, so that's one of the cool things that we'll be doing. Now, if you are, we actually in the United States, as long, well, rest of the world too, we are launching these, these weather balloons. You know, we call them a weather balloon. Um, you know, for this thing, we're calling it a high altitude balloon challenge. Um, you know, but these are, we, we launch weather balloons throughout the, the country. And one of the things that they're doing for aviation is they're looking to see what the um, winds are doing at different altitudes what the temperature is at different altitudes. Um, that's really important for uh, aviation. So um, let's see here. Jason, FYI, I'm still not picking up your, uh, your video if you're trying to share something. Uh, I'm gonna hang up on you. Um, let's see, you probably, well, <laughs> we're not talking so you can't hear what I'm telling you. Uh, let's try calling him back again. We're getting the Skype, the Skype dings. <laughs> so Retro Cosmodome, I uh, will answer that question in just one second. Uh, Kim, the answer is yes. We are recording, not only are we recording, we're recording with a lot more cameras than you're gonna be able to see during the live stream. This is an Air Force assigned mission, um, so we are not able to um, share that footage live. It has to be reviewed by the Air Force prior to us being able to show it. Um, so expect a really awesome post-flight video from us, probably within a week to, um, you know, the two weeks. Um, 
So a couple cool things here. So we are seeing the balloon actually has uh, almost come back onto itself. It really has turned 180 degrees now. Um, and the airplane is kind of holding around on the outside. Uh, we're seeing uh, Jason's unavailable. All right, so hopefully Jason will call us back. All right, so while we have that, let's take a look. We have a, um, a couple other questions. So do these payloads after reaching Apogee recover via tumbling or by a parachute? So the answer is both. Um, it has a parachute. So ultimately the recovery is gonna be based on parachute. Now here's the deal. This parachute is going to be deployed when the balloon bursts, right? So in the way it's gonna open, it's almost like if you were a kid and you, you, know, you get those little toy balloons, you drop them off your railing, you know, your house, right? You would drop it and then the balloon would open, right? Because air pressure is pushing up on it. Um, and so what will happen is when it first, that balloon, that balloon first bursts, it's gonna basically just come straight down. There's not enough atmosphere. Where it's going to be, it's only gonna be about 1% atmosphere. A matter of fact, the atmosphere where it's gonna to fly to is almost identical to the atmosphere on Mars, including the radiation. Um, so a lot of the, um, let's see here, I'm getting a thing from Michael. I can't answer that, Michael, unfortunately. Hang on one second, folks, I'm gonna mute you. I'll be right back. All right, so that was our site, um, uh, our local site. They are having a problem. The phone overheated. <laughs> so uh, that's why they weren't able to connect to us. Um, so what they're going to do is they're gonna let their phone cool down um, and then they are going to reach back out to us um, before launching the second balloon. So uh, where were we? So we were talking about the parachute. So um, there's not much atmosphere, so that, balloon is going to basically come or the uh the the, uh, the whole payload it's gonna come pretty much straight down uh, gravity is just gonna pull it straight down now as the atmosphere gets thicker and thicker and thicker um the balloon will start to inflate it'll start acting like a drone chute um now when we talk to colonel joe in, in probably about a half an hour um we're going to talk about one of the things that that they did, one of the real benefits to the work that they did was, and they're still using it today, is in a drone shoot. Um, you know, when there's less atmosphere, you're up really high. Um, you know, it's really, you, you need to, I apologize, I have four things going on at once on my screen, um, getting distracted. So they, um, but, um, so that will stabilize the package as it's dropping. And then, you know, the, the, there'll be more and more atmosphere and then eventually the parachute will fully open. Um, now, even once the parachute is fully open, you're still looking at about 2000 feet per minute, um, which is the other reason why, even though we're gonna have an airplane in the air, we're not, look, we're not likely to have um, a visual catch of it. One, it's gonna be pretty small, six feet, um, balloon, you know, a six foot, um, uh, even though it's red, a six foot um, uh, parachute from an aircraft that could be a few miles away, um, almost, it's gonna be very difficult to see. If they see it, we have a couple of folks that are in the airplane. So if we do see it, we're gonna go track to it. Um, but again, this thing is also gonna have about a 2000 foot per minute descent. Um, I can tell you in a 1A2, cause that's what they're gonna be flying and, and the 1A2 is typically what I tend to fly. Um, you know, anything more than a 12 to 1300 foot per minute descent, uh, means that you've got the engine off almost, or pretty much off. Um, you've got to idle and you know, that nose is down pretty good, um, in order to go there. All right. We've got Jason back. Let's see if we can get him. Hey, Jason, we've got you live. I heard you had an overheating all problem. All right. Let hey, me uh, get you back uh, you up You have here. the second balloon up yet? Oh, did you guys launch it? No, 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 just on the map. Uh, yes, I think we show another green balloon. I think so. All right, why don't you zoom in and let me know. 
Okay. Uh, you can also go over to the graphs tab and see if uh, when you click on a graph. Yeah, um, no, we've got it because I can see the um, I see the right. red line for the track and I see the green the green track and for you. And if you go to the the graph, yep. you can go ahead and see a uh, drop down in the top, and then you'll see uh, the green balloon is trackable. Okay. Yeah, there we go. SS07 is our second balloon, and SS05 is our first balloon. All right, and we're going to show uh, these are cool graphs. We'll so, show these to everybody once we get the second balloon up. So for all of the, the people, you know, that put their projects in, and balloon one is the one that launched first. I think it's SS05, um, Bob. And then the second one is going to be SS07 or something like that. And that's, that's obviously the second balloon. So if you're looking to see which project your, your balloon is on, that's how it goes. Balloon one launched first, red. And the green balloon launched second, green. All right? Cool. Now, Jason, just so you know, that first balloon, it actually tracked north and it made a 180 degree turn. It, it missed you guys. It, it came right back over All you. All right. Well, yep. So what's going to happen now is it's going to go south, um, southeast, and then we're going to hit the second jet stream uh, that's up above and it's going to track, I believe, uh, straight west before it bursts. And then it's going to follow the same kind of a track pattern, the same wind pattern down through the atmosphere, if that makes sense. Cool. So balloons don't just go one direction. There's winds at all different altitudes going all different ways. Why don't you talk to about uh, what is turbulence and, you know, wind patterns and why is that important? And now it's a ground pattern before flight. Yeah, so I think um, I, you broke up a little bit, but I think I got the gist of what you were saying there. So um, let's see here. So what, we'll keep an eye on you, Jason. I'm going to bring your, your volume down a little bit. Um, hey, do me a favor. Just let the person know who's videotaping. I think they've got their, fin their finger over half yep. the camera. So oh, you have your <laughs> finger over the camera. There we go. Uh, there's the, the bottom. Finger. Yeah, there we go. There you go. You okay, can great. try to flip it all the way around that way. <laughs> yeah, there you go. See if that works. Yep, that works great. That yep, work, that looks Bob? good. Yep, perfect. Thank you. All right, so I'm going to bring your volume down. Just wave to me when you guys are ready. All right, so what Jason's speaking about is in aviation, we have um, turbulence. Now, turbulence is caused by lots of different things, um, but one of the things it can be caused by is two air masses rubbing against each other. Um, when you think of the air, you know, uh, just think about water. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's a volume, it's a liquid, it's a volume. Now with air, it's a gas, right? But it behaves very similar to a liquid. So think about like, if you have a pebble in a stream, right? If you throw a rock into that stream, uh, that, that nice smooth stream will all of a sudden start rippling and will be deflecting around the rock. It'll get, it'll go up in spots. It'll go down in other spots. Um, and so one of the things that um, we, we look for is that will create turbulence um, is basically if you had a boat that was sitting in that stream and it would be going up and down, up and down, and that stream, uh, you would be getting bounced around as well. Um, so what we do is um, um, it, the other thing that can cause turbulence is when you get two air masses and they go in different directions. Now, from if you look at the map here, I'm going to bring up the map full screen. We'll come back to Jason in just a minute. Uh, let me pull this up here. Um, let's see. There we go. All right. Um, so as we can see here, we had the air mass actually moving in two different directions. When it first took off, it went north. And then it went to a certain altitude. And literally, it jumped into another airstream and it went almost, you know, due south again. Um, so you literally had two airstreams going like this. Now, if this is, um, if you, let's say this is really low to the ground and you're landing, this is important information to know, and we call it wind shear because you could be having a wind pushing or pulling. Oh, sorry. If they want to know about the balloon. Oh, okay. Uh, Jason, do you have something for us or were you guys just talking there? No, we're just talking. Uh, I'm going to start filling the second balloon here. Um, and uh, it's really hot here. Is it? <laughs> okay. Yeah. So I got the phone in the shade. I don't know where all my helpers went. They're probably hiding in the shade somewhere. <laughs> okay. Probably not as hot as South Carolina, though, but 
Uh, it's hot. It's 70 degrees in my office, so it's nice. Oh, you're <laughs> killing me. Um, all right, let me go back to the right. conversation. We'll come back to you. Just wave me down all when right. you're ready. All right. So, um, so if you're landing an airplane um, and the wind shifts from a headwind to a tailwind, that literally can almost immediately put less air across the wings and could cause the airplane to stall. Um, and so if there's wind shear on the airport, it's good for us to know about it because we are going to probably carry a little bit more speed into the landing, um, knowing that we could have some of the, our, our wind um, taken away from us. Um, so good question there. Um, let me take a look while we've got a few seconds for the, um, the chat here. Um, all right, so I do see, yep, we've got the balloon tracked. I'm gonna go ahead and bring the team live back on site. Um, yeah, so the p folks are talking about the, uh, the technology. Yeah, it's tough, even with our current iPhones and Android phones, everything else, right? It's a hot day. So, you know, somebody, uh, somebody needs to develop a liquid cooled uh, cell phone case. Well, so, um, you know, we have that issue too, as well in the, in the, in the airplanes. Um, you know, if you have, if somebody puts their, a lot of us run a program called, uh, for flight, I'll bring that back up. So this is for flight and we, a lot of us keep these in the windshields, but you know, you could overheat these as well. So this, this overheating thing is actually a fairly significant, um, thing you have to think about even in aviation. Um, cause you're going to be, you're gonna have to put your iPad or your cell phone in an area where it's not going to get that direct sun. Um, all right, let me get the other tracker back. See well, how our airplane is doing. Me, right? All right. The airplane is still cooking around. They're hanging off to the West. All right. Um, let's see. We'll bring you back to Jason's screen once he comes back online. So let me go back over to our balloon tracker. Okay, there's our balloon tracker. All right, so we're getting some good distance. Now we expected this to go about 20, um, about 25 miles, give or take. Um, all right, so a couple of questions here. Can you please show us the balloon data live? So yep, so here is the balloon data. Again, uh, as I mentioned earlier, um, we can't overload the tracking software. Um, so we can't unfortunately give folks the direct link. So the only way you're really gonna be able to see it is to see it through my eyes. Um, all right, so let's go ahead. Somebody asked about the actual data from the first balloon. So let's go take a look at that. So the first balloon is SS05. Um, and let's go take a look at it. So let's see, graphs. We are already at 30,000 feet. So let's do this together. First balloon. We are at 30,000 feet. I hear Jason calling us back. Okay, we, Bob, can you hear me? Yep, I hear you. Did we overheat again? All right. Nope, we're, uh, we're back. Okay, we're great. Good. Thanks, man. He's back. Sweet. Okay, sorry. You know, I'm trying to be IT and the balloon guy and the camera <laughs> guy. Oh, it's crazy. All right, here you go. Yeah, we don't, unfortunately, we don't have that SpaceX kind of money. <laughs> yeah. yeah, we got to, yeah, I think uh, all of CAP probably combined for the year doesn't have SpaceX money. <laughs> That's very true. That's time. very true. All right, let me sure. We're going we're gonna to start filling it here. Um, take a little pan over here. I got some cadets helping me um, hold all the projects off the ground here, and they hand it to me as we take off. And so, really appreciate it. And uh, so, I'm going to get started here. Very good, very good. And I can see the airplanes coming back towards you. And the first balloon is at roughly 32,000 feet. Okay, great. Oh, this is very cool. We can actually see the vertical rate as well. So the vertical rate, oh, yeah. the, it is climbing at about 1,200 to 1,400 feet per minute, between 1,000 and 1,400. So it's got a really Great. good climb. That's what we expected. And, uh, you know, today, you know, I had to change the flight plan a little bit, Captain Bob. And we're probably looking at like 88,000 feet today. Um, had to make a, a, a last minute change on the balloon technology we're using. So uh, maybe next time we'll get to that 100 plus thousand. Something Sweet. to look forward to. 
You got to switch tanks. There's no more helium left in this tank. Yeah, I absolutely love. I'm gonna show. I'm gonna come right back to you, Jason. Uh, I want to show them this graph. Uh, we'll still be able to hear you though. Um, take a look at uh, Captain Bob. Uh, just take a look at the speed it's traveling horizontally there. Yeah, that's actually what uh, we got just temperature, pulling up. You got all that you can take a look at. Yep. So, folks, let's take a look together. Um, again, if we look at the altitude, we are at almost 35,000 feet. So let's go ahead and move this balloon up a little bit more. Um, again, this is my first grade science project. I should get credit for this. <laughs> um, and then, so we have lots of great information here. We're tracking temperature. This you is really can, uh, cool. You guys can put it down. We are going to um, be able to take a look at the temperature. Now, now the temperature you're going to notice is cooling off at a pretty regular rate. Um, in aviation, we call this the adiabatic lapse rate. Um, it's about two degrees Celsius per thousand feet. Uh, or for those of you that don't know Celsius that well, it's about three and a half degrees Fahrenheit. Um, Per thousand feet. So, so now what we're going to notice is when we get up into the stratosphere, we're going to notice this actually, it's actually going to start getting warmer in some spots, um, which is very neat. Now, also, that um, when you look at the temperature, we, we talked about turbulence earlier, um, the stability of the air is you can almost measure it um, largely by the temperature. Temperature ma makes a huge point in the stability of the air um okay, let's uh, see Kevin here Bob, if you can hear me i can um, hear you take a look at uh in the in the graph section you can see spin rate yep and turbulence and that's accelerometer data and then the spin rate is what we call gyro and using those two that those two data uh you know systems we can see if there's turbulence in real time We'll definitely be able to see it on the video when it comes back, but that's what I use. Um, so when you see it change directions today, you might see some turbulence as you hit those different wind fields, yep. if that makes sense. Yeah, we actually, we, we show that. We show that um, there was a spike, um, sh you know, roughly when, when we had that turnaround, and we can see that the turbulence right now is very light. There's very little turbulence. Um, so the balloon is nice and calm. All right, and uh, he also mentioned the All speed. Right. Oh, you guys getting ready to fill that second one? Yep, we're gonna we're gonna get ready here. Okay. Well, so I got the second tank lined up and uh, just double checked everything. So we're gonna get going here. Awesome. All right. Looks like the airplane is coming back towards you. They looped up north. And again, for folks watching, the airplane, you know, depending on what they're doing with air traffic control, um, we're we're pretty close to an airport. So the air traffic controllers are probably speaking with them. Well, they have to be speaking with them. Okay, um, you guys ready? And so Here they may tell up. them at certain times that they have to move out of the way of another aircraft. Um, and you can see that they climbed with it because you can see that the aircraft right now is at 5,000 feet. So they, they, they must have saw, I'm like super excited about that, Jason. The, the aircraft did climb with that balloon. So they must have had hey. visual on it. That's great. Yeah, I'm super excited about that. Um, let's see here. Yeah, the track of the first balloon is almost a perfect um, southeast, south-southeast. Um, it yep. initially went north, but it is tracking almost um, due south-southeast. So for our folks in the incident command post, um, definitely go by the initial indications that Jason gave you, um, the initial track. And if this track is lining up with that track, then that should start giving our ground team um, an idea of where to start positioning themselves. So, very cool. All right. And I see that the CAP airplane is descending. Um, they're descending to the west of you. And so, uh, probably when they get back to the regular altitude, they're probably going to try to make it to you by then. Let me, while you're filming that, let me take a quick look. Uh, Jason, anything else you wanted to add? Well, actually, you're filming, so I'm going to mute you a little bit. Um, just from the noise of the the balloon being filled. Let me take a quick look at their chat. Let's see. Um, let's see. Actual, the data tab. Let's see. Let me go look through some older questions. Can you please show us the balloon data live? I think we just talked about that. What's the altitude of the first balloon? All right, let me take a quick look at that again. Um, so let's take a look at our graphs. We're going to take a look at altitude for the first one. 
and we are at just about 40,000 feet now. Um, and again, we are holding really steady climb rate. Um, you know, so if we look at that altitude versus time, really steady. Matter of fact, we click vertical rate. Um, you know, we can see the vertical right there and it's, it's holding pretty strongly at right around that 1200 foot per minute going up and down a little bit, but pretty close. Um, this is actually a really cool graph and we haven't talked about this one yet. And I love this graph. This is the graph of pressure. Um, now. What would be cool about this graph is maybe we can get the actual data and we can put this into Excel to correlate pressure with altitude. Right now it has it based on time, um, but it, you know, as you can see, you know, the pressure of the atmosphere is, is going down. I know it looks like it's a straight line, but I'm gonna say it's probably not. It's probably logarithmic in scale. Um, so it probably has that little bit of sloop, right? Um, if you think about a weight, right, if you were to lay on the ground and somebody put a one pound uh, weight on your chest, that wouldn't weigh too much, right? But then if they put a second one pound weight on your chest, you know, it's still a one pound weight you're adding, but now you have two pounds of weight. If you did that over and over and over again, right, you're gonna get 100 pounds of weight, 200 pounds of weight, 1,000 pounds of weight on your chest, right? That's what the pressure is in the atmosphere. It, it is gravity pulling all the mass that's in the atmosphere down. And so what it happens is it's literally weighing on top of each other. So the higher you get, the less mass in the atmosphere gravity can pull down on. And so that's why we have less pressure. And look at that, we've got the second balloon filling up. Our air crew is doing an absolutely fantastic job. And since our air crew is doing a fantastic job, I have to get a shout out to that incident command post um, and our mobile uh, communications team, which we're gonna see all these folks a little bit later. Um, they are all doing an unbelievable job because um, they have to, they ha you know, the, 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 ground, the, uh, the air crew can't see what Jason's doing on the ground. So there are people relaying the information from the ground up to uh, the airplane. And uh, a little bit later, they'll be, they'll be relaying that to the ground team. Um, so just fantastic job to those of you in the incident command post. Um, for those of you that are watching that are not CAP members, this is a bit of a taste of some of the stuff we do. We actually have all three of our missions uh, being performed today. We, the, the three main missions for Civil Air Patrol is aerospace education. Um, that is the mission that we're running this mission under. Um, that's where all the science that we do is under. Uh, we work with schools as part of our external programs. We have STEM kits. If you are a teacher and you would like um, access to great lesson plans and um, as well as uh, access to what we call top flights. Um, so as COVID restrictions allow uh, at your state, you can actually meet up with us. Oh, I got you. Yes, Jason. We're uh, gonna let it go in about ten minutes. About ten minutes. So we're uh, we're I'm making a uh, we got the team. They're calling the local airport. Uh, give them a heads up. Great. Uh, so they can uh, notify the aircraft in the area and uh, keep everything safe in the sky. Good deal. Now you should be able to uh, the folks on the ground there. You should all be able to see that cap airplane returning now. Um, they're still high. Um, I show them at 4,000, almost 5,000 feet. So they're higher than they were before. But that's cool because you know what that means to us is that they got some experience with that first balloon and they, they recognize that they can see this balloon from the air, which is awesome. We weren't sure if they'd be able to. Um, so the fact that they're staying up a little bit higher tells me that they're going to try to track this balloon through a higher altitude this time. Um, and so that's awesome. Um, again, uh, maybe I'm wrong, but that's what the data is telling me, um, that the pilot radioed in and said, hey, we can, we can track higher. Um, they also may be trying to stay out of the Class D um, and flying above the shelf of the air traffic control. That could be the other thing that they're doing too. Um, hey, Captain Bob, can yeah. you just tell them a little bit about the classes of airspace and maybe pull up uh, you know, the upside down wedding cake? <laughs> yeah, sure, let me, uh, let me see if I can get that, hang on. Uh, let's see here. We are going to switch over to here and we're going to say, um, let's see, FAA 
I'm just leaking a little bit of helium in there. Yeah. Just that much, little bit, could be the difference of miles on the other side. So I just want to squeeze all the helium out of this tank so that we get the flight profile that we're looking for. All right, so I'm going to see if I can get this picture up. Well, can anyway, you can talk about it later, Bob, but I mean, it's a, it's a thing that most people don't know about. You just look up and you see blue, but there's a whole bunch of stuff happening from an aviation standpoint. Yep, I'm trying to, to keep everybody safe. I think I've got it. Let me, so. just, um, let me just try to pull it in here and make it a little bit bigger. All right, let's see here. Let's try to make this bigger for you guys. One second. All right, if I can figure out a way to make this bigger for some reason. All right, let me show this. Um, Jason, let me know when to come back to you because we're going to switch off of you to show All this. All right, we got a couple more minutes. Okay, awesome. All right, we will still be able to hear you. Um, let's see here. So I want to go I'm tracking. All right, sorry I couldn't make this a little bit bigger for you. And first of all, this balloon's higher now, so let's go ahead and raise that up. Okay, so what Jason was indicating is that there's different classes of airspace. And um, we have class B. When we say B, just think big, right? These are your big airports. So this is where, you know, the Boeing air airplanes fly. Um, you know, your Airbus flies. This is your really big commercial airliners fly. Um, so think Atlanta. Think New York City. Think, you know, um, you know Dallas, Texas. Think Los Angeles, right? These are the really big um, airspaces. Class C still flies um, the bigger airplanes. So for instance, if you're in Buffalo, New York, Rochester, New York, that's my hometown. Um, you know, here in, in Greenville, South Carolina, where I am now, uh, Greenville Spartanburg Airport, that's Class C. And so that is still your bigger airplanes, but they don't have the number of airplanes um, that they do in the Class B. So Class B is big airplanes and a lot of them. Um, Class C is still typically some big airplanes, just not as many of them. Um, Class D is a little right, bit guys. more what we're used uh, to with um, uh, general aviation. Um, we either will fly into an uncontrolled airport where there is no tower. Um, that sometimes is a Class E, maybe even a Class G airport. Class G is uncontrolled. It's anybody can do anything they want just about in a Class G. Um, okay, Jason's ramping up the, 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 the crowd there, great. Um, and so because air traffic control is con you know, controlling this airspace, even though it's invisible to us, it, the air, airplanes, pilots, air traffic control, we are all very aware of these. Um, I'm going to show this here. Um, if I zoom out, we can zoom into, oh, we'll go up here. So this heavy blue here, this is, let me um, pull this up so we can see Jason and while we're doing this. Okay. Um, you can see this blue here, and that is a Class B airspace. So who is this? So this is... Some countdown, all right? All right. That is Detroit. Okay, so this airspace is Detroit. So Detroit is obviously a really busy airport. Um, and you'll see the upside down wedding cake. Um, so as you get closer, you know, it, it goes up higher and higher. It goes like this. Um, so this way, air traffic control is controlling any airplanes right. in here. So if you were, say, a general aviation pilot, and you didn't have authorization uh, to go into Class B, um, Class B, because it's so busy, you can't fly in there until air, air traffic control says you can fly in here. Um, and so if you don't have that, uh, that yeah, authorization, right. well, yeah. they're going to find you. <laughs> so because they have to make sure that you stay separate from the big airplanes. Their entire job is safety. Um, people... So let me go right, back to Jason. Oh, it's happening, Bob. It's happening. Now this thing is pulling up more than 20 pounds worth of weight. Um, so it's a really awkward kind of a thing to do. Um, but in order for us to launch this, we have about 11 pounds worth of payloads here. The FAA restrictions is anything under 12 uh, for more professional levels. Yep. And uh, so you got to have a lot more lift than you have payload weight. 
in order for this thing to take off as it needs to. So, all right, we're at the last payload. All right, you guys want to do a semicircle around me? Kind of cool picture, I don't know. So like get all the way over here. All right, we got some cadets here in the background. You guys ready? Okay, you guys ready? Are you guys ready? Seven, <laughs> nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. All right, 1150 launch. on that one but uh that's okay you know i hear the cap plane i think it's super high yeah they're um but we're off very good yeah the cap plane is currently 4500 feet so yeah so i think that they uh okay. th they had tracking of that first balloon and i think that they're going to try to stay with this this balloon up to a higher altitude so which is awesome okay cool there it goes. All right, so let's do me a favor on the on the ground there. Let's keep that. You're doing the exact thing I want. Um, let's keep that camera on that balloon, just for maybe another three four minutes until Great we can't job, see man. it, and then we're gonna reset. Then we're gonna go back to me, talking, um, and then we're gonna we're gonna go jump over to Colonel Joe. Um, so Colonel Joe's team in Florida, so, um, get yourself ready. I'll be calling you in just a couple so of minutes here. And um, that'll allow Jason and his team to get into so the building. That's the way to do it on a phone. Okay. I'm going to mute you there, Jason. Um, so if you need me uh, to get you back on, just uh, show yourself on the camera uh, and wave to me. All right. So there it goes. We have two successful launches. So exciting. Um, you know, and we're going to zoom in. And there we go. We can see the track of the first, the second balloon. Um, we're going to keep that video on that, that balloon just a little bit longer. So, so cool. I, I'll tell you what all, I am so excited. Um, and we'll be able to get to the, your guys' questions in just a second. Actually, I have it paused on my side, so it's not streaming up. Um, so I'm not seeing your questions yet, but I'll go back through all of them. Um, I am so excited for today. But I am so excited to be able to show you what we're going to be able to show you in probably about a week to two weeks. Um, we get all this video footage back when we get, um, you know, all the tracking data, when we get your final projects, when we get, when we get all of that and we're able to put all that together, that is going to be awesome for you to watch. I hope that you guys do watch that. Um, I had a couple of people question, you know, hey, how can we get, at, how can we see this when it comes out? Um, two things. Number one, you'll be able to see it because national, probably you'll get an email from Susan or another member of the national team. They will be able to um, send you an exact link when we get the, uh, the video out. But here, since here comes my shameless plug. People that are, on, the people that are used to YouTube, they're used to the, the shameless plug, the like and subscribe plug, right? So here's the like and subscribe plug. If you, if you subscribe to the channel, um, when and you hit the little bell icon, what it does is uh, it looks like they're done there on scene. Like, Jason, we're gonna hang to up with you guys up. and we're gonna switch over to Colonel Joe in just a few minutes. Thank you for the, the launch. Um, I'll ping you, text me when you guys okay. are ready. If you, yep, yeah, text me when you guys are ready yeah. inside hey. and then I'll call Everybody you back. There? Sounds good. Okay, we're gonna clean up, but thanks everybody. And uh, you know, I'll try to get to your uh, questions and uh. Thanks for joining us on this epic uh, launch with Civil Air Patrol. All right, but those of See you out inside. there, stay with it. Yeah, stay inside. Yeah. <laughs> all right, they're all, all hoping, right. they're all wishing they were wearing white right now. So, all right, we're gonna cut you off. Thanks so much, Jason. There they go. All right, so let's put up our balloon tracker. All right, let me um, let me show. I want to see the data now. Um, so let's show the graphs. Let's see, where is our first balloon? Our first balloon is at 55,000 feet. So let's go ahead and let's move this balloon all the way up to 55,000 feet. Um, super awesome. All right, again, my kindergarten <laughs> art project is working. Um, all right, let's do this. Um, Colonel Joe in Florida, um, if your team can stand by, I'm gonna give you a call in just about four or five minutes. So this is your 
four or five minute um, uh, warning. So those of you watching, keep watching because we have a lot more stuff coming your way. Um, we're going to be showing off the mission command station. Um, you know, in, in a CAP world, we call that an incident command post. Um, we're going to be showing you how we're communicating. Um, there is no radios, um, hit, you know, at this school. So we actually have a mobile command station for, um, for communications. And so we're going to show you that. Um, we're going to show you all the people behind the scenes that are doing all this work. Um, that really we couldn't do it without them. Um, so going back to the other question about, hey, how can I see this thing, you know, the, the future videos? Because uh, we have two really good, well, we'll have three. We're gonna have three really good videos that are gonna be coming your way. Um, actually, I, I'm lying to you, we're gonna have four. We're gonna have as quick as we can create it, maybe later, uh, probably sometime tomorrow, maybe Monday, um, we're gonna have a really quick recap video. Um, and then after that, we're gonna have a, once we get the uh, footage from the Air Force that allow, they, they tell us what we can show, what we can't show. My opinion is they're probably gonna say you can show just about everything. Uh, we're not looking for you know, a downed airplane or something where there could be something critical in a security nature. So we'll probably get access to just about everything. Um, and then we're gonna be able to chance to put all that together in a really great video. Then um, even though it's probably gonna be the easiest video for me to put together, it's actually one of the ones I'm most excited about. I'm gonna put together a, a video that's gonna show the entire balloon, um, one of them, yep, look at that. It's going almost the same track as before. Let's see if it turns around the same way as the other one did. Um, and it'll, um, it, um, if, if it takes an hour and a half, I'm gonna show the whole hour and a half from the camera inside the balloon. I'm gonna throw some music on it, um, you know, so it's not just the video, but that might be a really cool thing. Just so you know, if you're studying or you're doing something in the background, you're at work, you know, and you, you can just throw it on your thing, go, hey, what does this thing look like for the whole hundred? Cause you're gonna see something that you, you're never likely to see with your eyes, unless you can get the hundred thousand dollars or whatever it is to go on a SpaceX or a Boeing or uh, sort of Richard Branson's, um, you know, airplanes, uh, rocket rides. Um, so, all right, so that's that question. Oh, going back to the thing. So if you hit the subscribe button, if you hit the bell icon, when the new videos come out, um, and the channel is, you know, it's not an official CAP channel, right? It's my channel, but like 99.9999% of the videos on there will always be CAP. I think there's one video of when I took my kids to Disney that I want to keep on there because <laughs> um, it got popular on a Disney forum. I don't want to take it down. But other than that, every video on there is CAP. So uh, it's like the official unofficial CAP AE channel. Um, but if you hit, the, so anything we put something up there, you'll get a notification inside of YouTube that we put up a new video. Um, let's see here. The other thing too is, again, if you if you do the subscribe and like thing, um, th that actually, you'll hear this from all the YouTube people, um, that helps the Google algorithm to know what to show other people. So it actually means a lot. So if, if, if you can, um, you know, hit that subscribe button that actually will help uh, folks to see the A channel. Amazingly, if you type in aerospace education right now, um, this channel actually is the number one channel that comes back on Google. Um, so super proud of that. There's a lot of folks that have helped with that. Um, all right, so while they're doing that, let me go ahead and give Colonel Joe a call. All right, well, Call on them right now. See? Y'all dance to the music. All right, there they are. Let's go ahead and show them. All right, you guys are back. So how did, how did it look for you guys? You excited about those launches? It was exciting uh, and uh, very informative. Great. Colonel Joe, um, you know, the cadets are sitting there, they're wondering, I can see it in their eyes, is Captain Ro Roberts gonna ask us a question? I'm gonna keep them on their toes, I might ask them a question. Um, but I know you have, you guys are gonna be talking in just a few minutes as well, but I had one question for you. As we're tracking the first balloon, especially now through 55, 60,000 feet, you are one of the few people alive that has done that. Now, you are a special person who has done it, because yes, we have astronauts that have gone higher than that. But you took the slow ride to get to that altitude. You didn't go on a rocket that was jostling around and all of a sudden you were up in space. Uh, you took the slow ride. So, so you actually know. What's it like to be at 50,000, 60,000, 70,000 feet? Well, you're, you're, as you're going aloft, of course, the pressure suit starts inflating at 40,000 feet. And uh, 
you're, you're, all you do, you cannot tell your altitude above the ground except your altimeter. And I, I, would, I had a constant interest in that altimeter. And of course, as I went aloft, it got colder and colder and colder. But let me say this, Bob, I made five high altitude balloon flights. Uh, the lowest was 75,000, the highest was 103,000 feet. But the same principle that they use in the weather balloons with the positive lift of the helium, uh, or if you're using hydrogen, as a matter of fact, hydrogen has a higher lift factor than helium, but as you pointed out, it was more flam it's flammable, whereas helium is not. But I had a, a great interest in my altitude that went to law, is my pressure suit constantly inflated to keep my body at 40,000 feet. The pressure suit kept my body at 40,000 feet, even though I was almost in a vacuum of space. Now, we did this program uh, called Excelsior for, for two reasons. First of all, man had never been in an actual space environment before, and man had never had to depend upon a pressure suit to, to exist. And we knew that when we went into space that we'd be getting outside the spacecraft. So there were lessons that we needed to learn uh, prior to the space program. The other purpose was to develop a means of escape from very high altitude. But in order to do that, we had to get up to 100,000 feet because we, we had airplanes that were flying at that altitude and we were going to have spacecraft that were going to be going through that altitude. So there was a good scientific reason why we were doing the program. Uh, and we is the same protocol that the cadets used for this program. They dreamed up a reason to, to, for their experiment. Uh, they constructed the experiment. Uh, and when it gets down, they'll analyze the data just like we did. So what we're doing here today is the same that we did back in the, in the 50s on our high altitude balloon research programs. And I think it just, it's really unique that here now, uh, some uh, 50 years later, that we're using the same vehicle for high altitude research that we did back in the 40s and 50s. The uh, balloon is a, a, a cheap way to obtain data. Now, when this, these packages come back, these experiments come back, they'll be analyzed, there'll be a report written on each one of them. There'll be a committee that will be uh, put together to analyze the best, the very best experiment of all of the 650, they're gonna pick out one. And that person that, and that team that won, that is the best will get the trophy and the honorarium. So there's a, a great benefit and, and, and a recognition for that team that, that uh, come up with the best experiment. <laughs> um, what else could I say, Bob? No, I think that's great. Um... Carol, Joe, I'm going to give you and the staff there a little update as well. The uh, first balloon is now crossed 60,000 feet. It is still climbing at uh, about 1,200 feet per minute. So that climb rate is still going great. We're now at 63,000 feet. I can see that the cap airplane is starting to come back down. Um, so they're probably going to start coming in for a landing. Um, so let me ask, I, I, I warned you, the cadet, I warned the cadets. I told you I was going to get you into this. So what um, what questions or conversation would you guys like to have there on, on site? I know, you know, I, 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 Joe, I, Carl, Joe, I know that you hate, you know, probably when people say, you know, you're a legend, right? And you, you're probably, you know, you're a humble man. And but listen, seriously, you're a legend. So, <laughs> so um, you know, so the cadets that are, that are sitting next to you, um, you're sitting next to a legend. Um, and so I, I would love, I would love to hear a little bit uh, between you and the cadets, if they have any questions or anything you'd like to talk to them about. I'm available. Any questions? So I wanted to know, like, if you were to do the high altitude balloon challenge, what would you put in the capsule? Uh, that's a good, good question. Uh, if, you, if you don't mind, the, Colonel Joe, I'm just going to repeat the question so that we can hear it better for the folks online, just real quick. So the question was, if um, Colonel Joe was going to be part of the, his, his challenge, uh, what would he put in the vial for this, the experiment? Thanks. Go ahead. Well, one of the great interests we had back in the 50s was cosmic radiation. And uh, we, uh, we uh, had experiments to define cosmic radiation. We used, we used a emulsion plates, and we could detect the direction of the, of the uh, cosmic ray 
through that emulsion plate. So if I had one item to take aloft, it'd probably be a something to measure cosmic radiation because uh, you're, you're actually out there amongst it. And cosmic radiation is one of the real challenges we have going to, uh, to Mars uh, because they're going to be there for, for a long period of time, uh, over a year transit from launch to getting to Mars, and then they'll spend a year on Mars and then a year back. So they'll be exposed to a tremendous amount of radiation. Uh, so that's one of the great uh, challenges that we have for going to Mars is radiation. So the more we can learn about radiation, uh, the, the more it will make it safe for our astronauts that are going to, to Mars, because uh, that's going to be a, a quite a challenge. And, and we haven't solved that problem yet, but we will. Uh, it's, it's, it's a challenge. But that's a long answer to your question. It would be something to do, measure radiation. Thank you, sir. Now, Colonel Joe, let me ask a follow-on question to that. Um, in, when you went up, they did experiments uh, very similar to what you just mentioned, and uh, the young lady there mentioned, uh, talked about, and that was putting film um, around the head of mice and guinea pigs. Is that right? Yes. Uh, the early uh, test we did, we, we put had an emulsion plate on top of a guinea pig, and they had a, a structure that held the emulsion plate, and the guinea pig was beneath it with this emulsion plate on the... the uh, guinea pig's head. So we knew exactly the direction of the cosmic radiation into the, the chickmouth's brain. We could track it from that. And we also did that with, with monkeys. Uh, we, so we used those, those animals to show man how to, to cope with radiation. And it was, a, it was our unique beginning was, was with, with the guinea pigs and, and, uh, and monkeys showing the direction of the cut radiation through their brain. Wow, that's cool. How about the young man there? Uh, does he have a question for, for Colonel Joe? Uh, yes, sir, I do. Um, if you could give one message to the youth of today uh, based on your past experience, what would you tell them? A very good question. Uh, let me say that uh, the uh, effort that went into this was a team effort. Uh, you, man cannot accomplish anything by himself. It takes a team working together. And I think you should always think about the team uh, dynamics, the team psychology, because you have to work together in order to accomplish anything. The other thing is, it takes hard work. It takes a lot of dedication. I, I've never met a successful person that didn't work hard at what they do to accomplish their task. So hard work, setting goals, working as a team, all of these are things that, that are important for your future. Um, well, the other thing, of course, that, that I say that you know, we, are, we are so fortunate here in the United States. We, we live in the greatest country that's ever been. We have wonderful opportunities but because of our, our intellect and our, our background, our democracy. Uh, if you have a, a dream, you can work toward that dream. All it takes is dedication and hard work and setting a goal and then working toward that. So I think that a program like this shows teamwork, dedication, organization, and it's just a wonderful example of what can be accomplished if you work together for a common goal. Does that answer your question? Yes, sir. Good. All right, how about the young lady? Does she have anything else that she wanted to ask? Um. Sir, what was your favorite moment being throughout your entire career? What was your favorite moment? A very good question. What was my favorite moment in my entire career? I would say my favorite moment was when I landed after jumping from 103,000 feet mm -hmm. and I was back to the earth. <laughs> that, was my, that was my favorite moment because I had confidence in what I was doing. I had confidence in the team. I had confidence in what we were doing but there's still an unknown. And when I got on the ground, I was the happiest person in the whole world. That's great. Um, you know, it, Colonel Joe, you and I talked about this once before, and actually for the folks there in Florida, I want, you know, this is a bigger, you talk about the team, right? And so if I could get the folks that are there with you in Florida to come 
back by you. I, I want us, the folks online to be able to see um, the team that it takes just to even put on um, the video footage to talk to you today. Uh, we have lots of other cadets and other senior members there. So if you guys can all go on and, and, and stand behind Colonel Joe for a second, I think it'd be great for the folks online to see. Yeah, so look at this. This is awesome, right? So we're gonna we're gonna hopefully do something very similar. Yeah, get everybody, get her in there. So so we're gonna we're hopefully gonna get a chance to get everybody uh, as well in Indiana to show you this. But you know, we talk about that team, right? You know, this is, you know, 200, 300 years ago, maybe you could do something by yourself. Nowadays, you have to have a team. Um, I, you know, I'm, I mean, just, I'm so proud of all of you that are there um, to really help bring this event and to help bring Colonel Joe um, out to, to everybody. Um, you know, thank, thank you for everything and all your time. Um, you know, again, just applause for you. Thank you. The, the, the internet, the internet chat is applauding you all as well. <laughs> um, so great job. All right, now get out of my way. You're in my shot. Right. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Bob, in, in summary, it, it takes three things working together to accomplish a task. First of all, you have to have confidence in your team. You have to have confidence in your equipment, and you have to have confidence in yourself. Those are three main ingredients that you have to have. Working together, you can accomplish anything. Trust, trust in yourself, trust in the team, and trust in your equipment. You know, um, speak a little bit, you know, I, um, we've got a few minutes left, if you're okay with it. I, I don't want to take time away from the cadets. If, if you had anything for the cadets, or if the cadets had any more questions, do you guys have anything else that you wanted to ask Colonel Joe about before I take up all your time? Because I, listen, I like talking on a camera. I'll talk all day long if you let me. So do you guys have anything that you, else that you'd like to talk about there first? Yeah, we have a couple more cadets if you want to switch them out. Good. Yeah, let's Good. do that. Yeah. People don't want to talk to me all day long. They want to hear what these cadets have to say. I want to hear what they have to say, too. I think it's very important to, to answer their questions. Take your questions. Absolutely. And by the way, they've been very good questions, so now it's your turn. <laughs> so I'll tell you what, so if you're on site, so for the folks that are on site, give us, uh, don't give us your first name, but give us your rank and your last name uh, before you do your question. Sir, I'm Staff Sergeant Marsal, and um, I was going to ask, um, what was going through your mind during that jump? What was going through my mind going through the jump? Well, let me tell you what, that when you do something like this, I, I had tremendous training. I had a great team working together on me, and I had done this jump a hundred times in my mind. I had, I had gone through it completely. And I had complete confidence in my equipment and my team and what I was doing. Uh, but there's still the unknown. And, but I had a certain mental state that I knew I was going to accomplish what I set out to do. I would have not been there if I had felt any idea that I was not going to survive the, the event, even though there was an unknown part of it. But you, you, you don't do something like this on the spur of the moment. You think about it, you plan on it, you come with every contingency. And you get mentally attuned to doing it. And then it's just a question of, of accomplishing the task that you set out for. Thank you, sir. Did I answer your question? Yes, sir. Very good. Uh, Kid of Senior Millennium. And um, I just want to ask if, when I watched a few videos on a few of your jumps and on, I believe it was the 103,000 foot one, that your right glove didn't seal right or something happened with it. What did that feel like? Well, let me say that we had, I had tested the equipment, but I, I know, the hands were pressurized and the feet were pressurized because in a partial pressure suit, the body is kept at 40,000 feet, but you had to have special gloves for your hands and socks for your feet. And they were pressurized also. So the hands and your feet were at 40,000 feet also. So what happened on the way up after I'd been successfully testing the equipment on the ground, somewhere between the ground and 40,000 feet, the pressure suit glove on my right hand broke, it didn't work. 
So when I got to 40,000 feet and my pressure suit was inflating, I checked the pressure suit and I checked the, my feet, the pressure, and I pricked my hands and I suddenly realized that my right glove was not pressurized. And I also knew in, that it would, it would be subjected to space, to a vacuum. I also knew if I told the people on the ground about my problem, they would have immediately made me abort the flight. Mm -hmm. So I didn't make, I did not want to make them worry. But no one had ever gone into space with a hand or a foot not pressurized. So I was going to a, into an environment that had never been done before. But I had confidence that, that it would work because I had on my hand, I had a silk glove and then I had my pressure suit glove and then I had a flying glove over that. So as my hand expanded due to the lack of pressure, it actually got pressurized because of the silk glove and the other glove. So it wasn't completely in a space environment. But in any event, I couldn't use it. Uh, it swelled up twice as normal size. And, but everything we had on the, to do the jump, I could do with the left hand. But we had gone through that. If something happened that you couldn't use both hands. So everything I could uh, to do the flight, I could do with my left hand. So it was painful. It, it was sore. I couldn't use it. It was useless. But uh, we had a backup, and the backup was used left hand for all the, the mechanism. The only thing we didn't have to do, we, we couldn't pull the, the lanyard. This lanyard started a timer that would deploy the drogue chute after 16 seconds. I couldn't get that with my, with my left hand, but it was tied to the gondola. So when I jumped out, the line pulled the lanyard. And you'll see the pictures of me jumping, you see a a line between me as I'm free falling away, and that line was pulling a timer that I could not do with my right hand or my left hand. But we had a backup. We, we had planned on something like this happening, and it worked exactly right. And uh, when I got down the ground after a couple of hours, my hand was back to normal. And uh, uh, But it was uh, the only thing that didn't work on the whole flight was that glove that I had in my right hand. But we had a contingency for it, and it worked out okay. Now, if the pressure suit hadn't worked, I would have abort. I had to abort then, because that pressurized my whole body. But the glove, I took a chance, uh, and it, it fortunately worked out. But uh, that was the only real uh, violation of the procedure that we had set up. But I said I didn't want to let the people on the ground know that I had a, a challenge like that because. I had a concern that might not be able to have an opportunity to do it again because there's a lot of people that against what we were doing. So I, I, had a, I felt that if I didn't get this jump this time, that I might not have another opportunity. So I accepted the risk of my hand not be pressurizing because I felt it was in the benefit of the total experiment. That's a long answer to your simple <laughs> question. But that's it. No, thank you. Very good. How about other questions from um, on site there in Florida? I know we had a, a lot of cadets. We have some senior members. Any other questions there? Ask them now. Otherwise, you got to listen to me talking. You don't want to do that. We, we have another one. Please come up here. Sir, um, Name, rank, seal number. Yes, sir. <laughs> <laughs> I am. Well, sorry, uh, with her. Yes, so um, I'm with FL049 Orm Beach Composite Squadron. Uh, I'm First Lieutenant Jameson. Um, and I just wanted to ask, how did your time as a pilot kind of eventually lead you to um, doing these space jumps? A very good question. Uh, first of all, I was a, a, a test pilot mm -hmm. and uh, used to having uh, mission objectives and flight objectives. Uh, being a fighter pilot helped. If I would have been a bomber pilot, it wouldn't have been near as good. But being a fighter pilot, you're used to doing things by yourself. Uh, you're in complete control of the aircraft. Uh, you don't have any help from anybody else. So I think being a fighter pilot uh, helped me to have the mental attitude to accomplish this task. Not that a bomber pilot couldn't do it, but fighter pilots can do it better. Um, and also, um, what kind of inspired you to take that journey of becoming a pilot? What kind of what? To become a pilot. What inspired you to do that? What, what, did you, how did so, you, like what, what inspired you to become a pilot um, before you, you took Well, like all of you here, all you cadets that are in the CAP, 
you have a vision of being an aviator. Uh, that's, that's why you're here. You're, you're interested in aviation. And this is a great stairway to aviation, into being a pilot. Uh, there's no better education than a CAP to give you the lessons that you need to be a pilot. So learn what you're doing, what you're doing, and what you've been exposed to is going to help you achieve that accomplishment. But of course, in the Air Force and the Army, there's a whole team of people. The pilots are just the lucky ones that get to fly airplanes. But it takes an awful lot of other people to get you there and to keep you there. So it's teamwork once again. But I would say that the, the biggest thing, when I was a young boy, uh, I was just captivated with aviation, like all of you cadets. You, you, you're interested in aviation because if something could happen to you in your life, you saw something that interests you uh, in the profession. Well, I had that happen to me when I was a very young age. And when I was a young lad uh, at your age, I set a goal to be an aviator. And I, I, everything I did in school and what I learned was toward that goal to be an aviator. So the answer is set a goal, work hard, and, and, and keep dreaming on accomplishing that goal. So, thank you, sir. Hey, Colonel Joe, while we're gathering, uh, you know, we'll let the, the folks there think if you have other questions. Um, we definitely want to hear those. Uh, we, did get a, we did get a question from the internet, um, and it goes back to something you were talking about before. They wanted to know, when you lost the pressure in your glove, did your hand go numb? Well, it, it became a little, it became painful. It became painful. It, it swelled up twice its size. And fortunately, the glove kept it from getting bigger because the blood would go, the blood would go to, to the skin. But uh, it, was, it was painful. Uh, it didn't go numb. I could feel the pain. And uh, if it, I wish it had gone numb because I wouldn't have felt anything. Then. <laughs> so it actually hurt. I, yeah. yeah. So the, uh, the other thing I want to point out real quick, and then we're going to get some more questions from you guys there in Florida, um, is for the folks on the Internet, we've got a lot of folks that are watching online. And so for the folks online, this is a really cool opportunity for you to ask a question as well. So, um, you know, we're going to go back to the folks in Florida, but go ahead. This is interactive. This is live. Um, this is not recorded. This isn't something you're watching, you know, on YouTube two years from now. Um, so go ahead. If you have a question for Colonel Joe, go ahead and ask it in the chat and then I'll relay that to Colonel Joe. Um, all right. So back to one thing, one question, who are the squadrons that we have there with you? Where are they from? Um, sir, today uh, it's just Ormond Beach Composite Squadron. So uh, we're based at um, Ormond Beach and from the Ormond Beach Municipal Airport. Very good, very good. Um, do you all have more questions for Colonel Joe? By the way, there was going to be a lot more CAP cadets here, but because of the, the virus situation, it was reduced to these wonderful people that are here today. But there was going to be a lot, much larger audience, but it's because of the situation that we had. Yeah, it's unfortunate. We are we are, we are limited. Thank, thankfully, in Indiana, um, they they don't have as many restrictions right now as we're seeing in Florida. So uh, so thankfully for Indiana, it's not a big as big an issue. But um, we are so proud of all of you there in Florida uh, for being able to do that. Um, all right. So some. All right. I know the answer to this, Colonel Joe. But somebody's asking online, so I'm going to let you answer. How old are you? <laughs> I'm 39. 39. Man, he no, looks good for I'm 39. I'm 93 years old. 93. Hey, by the way, I, I still fly airplanes and balloons. Uh, I have uh, 16,800 hours of flying and 93 different airplanes. So I had a wonderful career in aviation. Uh, and it is a wonderful career made up of very dedicated people. But we have a lot of fun flying airplanes. It's just nothing but fun. But there's two other questions that have been asked here. Let me, let me please. <laughs> yes, sir. So earlier you mentioned that your happiest moment in your career was when you landed after that jump. Um, what was the first thing you did after landing? First thing I did was say a, a thank you prayer. <laughs> that was the very first thing I did. And then the next thing I did was try to get out of my pressure suit. <laughs> <laughs> that was your question? Yes, sir. Thank you. Good. I'm going to try to pull up a real quick um, picture of you in the in the 
refresher suit just for the folks that haven't seen it. Um, any other questions on site? We've got a couple of questions online, but I want to give you guys the opportunity on site first. Sir, when you look back, uh, you know, on all the amazing things you've done, uh, what really sticks out to you as something that you're very proud of and, you know, is very touching to you? Well, the thing I'm most proud of was to be a member of a team that conducted research on escape my altitude. The lesson we learned on escape my altitude is still being used today. Every ejection system in the world uses a drogue chute for low altitude ejection and for high altitude stabilization coming down. So what we did back in 1959, 1960 is still being used today. And that makes us all very proud of what we did because it's not something that was just something temporary, but something that's lasted and saved a lot of lives. So what we accomplished was for the good of, of aviators around the world. That's your question. Yes, sir. Thank you. I'm putting up a quick picture of you with your um, with your your pressure suit up. Hopefully, folks can see that online. Um, let's see here. So, so that you had a pair. Where was your parachute? So the, the, the it was that in front of you. Is that what the big bulge is in front of you? Is that the parachute, or is the parachute behind you? No, the parachute was behind me. The one in front of me was my emergency parachute. Okay. You always have a reserve parachute, and that's that was the one in front. The normal parachute was on the back. Gotcha. And by the way, I weighed, uh, at that time, you won't believe this, but I weighed 160 pounds, and my equipment weighed 160 pounds. So I weighed a total of 320 pounds during that free fall. And because, and I had a kit on. The kit had, well, weighed 65 pounds. But every aviator has a kit strapped to his rear end that has a life preserver or survival equipment. So I was in the exact configuration that an aviator would be in. Aviators had a pressure suit. Aviator had a had a uh, a kit. So I was exactly like an air crew member jumping in, except for the reserve parachute, which was rel relatively small and lightweight. Did right, I answer so, your question? Yeah, that was perfect. Um, all right. So so people want to know more about your age. So how <laughs> so how old were you when you made the jump? I was thirty two. Thirty two. Um, let's see. Another question I'm hearing is one second. Would you recommend pursuing a space jump? So we still have some folks today. Space folks are still doing some high altitude balloon jumps. Or would you recommend that? Only if you're going to acquire knowledge. Uh, you know, the, the, the record right now is held by a fellow from Orlando, Florida, as a matter of fact, Alan Eustace who uh, jumped from 137,000 feet. Boy, that's, that's really up there a long ways. And when you get to be 137,000 feet, you got three millibars of pressure, almost a complete vacuum. So you're, you're already into space. Um, so I, 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 would, I would support it only if it's gonna give us knowledge that we need for the space program and for escape systems. Very cool. Um, do you recall what was what was the speed you hit when you were at terminal velocity? I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't hear the question. Uh, terminal velocity. Somebody asked the question, what speed did you hit for terminal velocity? Do you recall? Uh, it was, I think it was about 1,600 feet per second. It was, wow. Uh, 614 miles an hour, uh, 0.94 Mach. Wow. That's amazing. But I got to remember this. It was in a complete vacuum. It was my true airspeed. My, my, the equipment didn't flutter. When I was doing 600 miles an hour, my, my pressure suit was not moving at all because I was in a vacuum. Now, as I fell, the density increased and I slowed down. Until about 18,000 feet, I was turning velocity at about 200 miles an hour. When I landed, I was doing uh, 18 feet per second. So. It has, a, it has to do completely with the atmosphere that's around you. I had no idea I was going that fast. I had no way of knowing because I was in a vacuum. I was in a sp space environment. And it was my true airspeed, not my indicated airspeed, because my indicated airspeed was, would be the, the density corrected. So uh, I had no way of knowing I was going that fast because there's no telephone poles, there's nothing you can see, your, 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 your vertical descent. So you're completely dependent upon the instruments. I had an altimeter and a stopwatch, and I had a great interest in altimeter. 
And I, I knew exactly what altitude I was at, but you had no way of knowing what speed you were going because there was nothing there to judge speed. You judge speeds by your depth perception, by visual acquisition. And when you're in a space environment falling, you don't have any guideposts to see how fast you're traveling. Hey, one real quick thing before we have more questions. Um, it does look like from the track, um, it does look, yeah, definitely. Um, so we hit 90, just shy of 90,000 feet with the first balloon. Um, I made, oh, here, you guys can't see that. I can move it over. There we go. Um, we are definitely seeing a, a downward descent now, uh, a very fast downward descent. So if we look at the verticals, the vertical rate now as well. Yeah, look at that. So we are hitting 8,000 feet per minute. That thing is just falling out of space. Um, all right, very cool. And I did make the graph a little bit bigger for the folks online. Um, so folks wanted to see that some of the data. Um, one of the questions we got online was about another um, space jumper that you worked very closely with, and that was Felix. Um, so somebody asked the question if you knew who Felix was, <laughs> and you did a lot more than know who Felix was. Um, can you explain how your relationship with Felix was? Well, I worked five years with a program that's called Project Stratus, uh, and I taught Felix Bumgarner everything he knows. <laughs> <laughs> Literally. <laughs> Realize that Felix Bumgarner had 2,500 jumps. When I made my jump, it was my 33rd jump. <laughs> I was there to test equipment for pilots, and pilots don't have a lot of parachute jumps. So uh, they didn't want me to have a lot of jumps because they, somebody would say, well, you were a parachute jumper, so what you learned would not uh, equate itself to an aviator. So there was a big difference between the number of jumps that Felix had and I had. Felix was there to do a free fall from space, a skydive from space. He did not have a system that an air crew member would use. Now, by the way, when Felix jumped, he entered into a, he was a 2,500 parachute jump. He entered into a spin, 60 RPM. With all of his knowledge and all of his experience as a parachute jumper, he could not control the spin. And that's the exact reason why we developed that stabilization parachute to give enough drag so you had stabilization because aviators are not skydivers. So they have to depend upon the equipment that they use. So I worked five years in that program. I was the uh, capsule commander. I was a person in complete contact with Felix. Uh, we spent uh, months going through the procedures, techniques. Uh, I taught him everything I knew about parachute jumping and you know, free falling from space because I had three jumps from, from high altitude. But uh, it was a very interesting project. Uh, he set a record at that time, 127,000 feet. and. Uh, uh, but Alan Hughes went 10,000 feet higher, and Alan holds the record now for highest parachute jump. But it was a very interesting thing working with Felix. I only did it because uh, he convinced me that the program would have some scientific merit, and it did. We, we as a matter of fact, demonstrated why we need stabilization for parachute. Because here was a guy with 2,500 parachute jumps, and he had done to a spin. So uh, his his program showed why we need stabilization from very high altitude. But it was a very interesting program. I thoroughly enjoyed being a part of it. Uh, we, uh, and I think we helped Felix a great deal. He felt comfortable because he knew I was on the radio. He asked me to be on the radio with him. And we talked all the way up. And we discussed what ifs. Every contingency that could come up, we had discussed. We had a plan for it. And uh, it was a well done program because of the communication we had between Felix and myself. And uh, as I said, I taught him everything he knows. Yeah, and that, to be honest with you, I don't think that's you being humble. <laughs> I think or, you know, I, I think you probably really did. Um, if anybody hasn't watched that, uh, that document, unfortunately, you know, when Colonel Joe did his jump, they didn't have the sheer qu quantity of cameras that they do now. Um, so if you want to see Colonel Joe in action with Felix, um, there is an absolutely fantastic uh, documentary that was created. Um, they, they had the money for the big budget <laughs> for, for that type of uh, gear. Do you remember what the name of that document? It wasn't like Into the Blue or I forgot what they called that documentary. Do you remember? 
I can't remember, but if anybody wants to see my parachute jump, they can go to my website, uh, joekittinger.com, and the, the jump is on that website. Oh, very cool. Um, actually, let me do that. So joekittinger.com. I'm going to pull it up, and I'm going to grab the link. Very cool. Oh, you actually have really, oh, I'm so, oh, this is the Red Bull Strata story. Okay, okay, I was going to say, I'm, I'm like, wow, they didn't have cameras that looked that good when you jumped. Um, all right, let's go here. I'm going to go ahead, I'm going to post for the internet chat group. I'm going to go ahead and put the link to uh, to Colonel Joe's website there. Um, so you can, don't click on that here. You can say open in a new window, otherwise you'll lose you. Um, all right, we're going to head over pretty soon to the on-site. Um, that balloon one is already down to 40,000 feet. So uh, do we have other questions there in Florida for Colonel Joe? They were very good questions, by the way. Thank you very much for, for the questions. Very good questions. Thank you. Um, all right, so here's what we're going to do for you, the folks there in Florida. We're going to go over, and so, Jason, if you're listening, this is your two-minute warning. I'm going to be coming back to you. Um, we're going to be talking about the, the high-altitude balloons, uh, what they do. Now, we have a whole bunch of other questions, and so what I would like to do, uh, Colonel Joe, is when we probably is maybe about half an hour or so, I'd like to come back to you. So maybe give you guys a chance to get some water, get some food, and if you're okay with it, we're going to keep taking the questions online and then we'll come back to you with that. And then um, we'll probably going to get confirmation that the ground team has acquired um, the first balloon. And then we'll do a little goodbye message for everybody. And that's going to wrap it up, man. man. This day is flying. So with that, Colonel Joe, we will talk to you in just a few minutes. Thanks, everybody. We'll call you in about half an hour, give or take. Cadets, thank you so much. Great questions. Bye, all. All right, let's see. Let me get over to the balloon tracking. All right, um, Jason, we will be reaching out to you in probably about five minutes. Um, so if you're out getting some drink and water, <laughs> hurry up. Um, all right, let's see. And hopefully you're gonna be in, indoors with a, with a real camera. So we won't, we won't have the problem we had before, hopefully. So um, let's see here. Yeah, you know, somebody asked the question. First of all, I love your, you love your name, your, your, your name, OH210 Aerospace Education. Um, you know, they asked the question, you know, we're gonna ask him that, you know, what's the secret behind a healthy mind in his 90s? Um, you know, as somebody now, I'm not even half his age. Um, and, you know, I'm pretty certain he could, do you know triple laps around me mentally um so yeah he, he, yeah that's a really great question um we need to study him <laughs> as a lab rat to see how he's how he's doing that um all right let's take a quick look at um our track so let's see let me get this back up into the regular window um all right now check this out the second balloon is in green um the first and the first balloon was in red right and we see the little burst icon there with the the red uh so it won't make it bigger but um let's see here we can see the red burst icon but that green the second balloon it is tracking almost identical um to that first one now here's the cool thing about that that means our ground team um, they're not going to have to drive 100 miles between one balloon and the second balloon. There's a really good chance that second balloon is going to um, is going to be able to uh, land relatively close, maybe even within a few streets. So of that first balloon, so that's awesome. When we get done with all of this, um, it won't be on today's live stream. But when we get done with all of this, we are going to um uh jason i would like to have an image of what the projected track was and i'd like to put that on top of or have these uh balloons put on top of that track so you and i'll figure out how to make that you know graphically happen because um, i think it'd be really fascinating to see how close the uh the estimated track was to what the real track was um let's see here let's check real quick the graphs um, we can see that the first balloon has now passed the, um, the second balloon because now it is down to 32,000. So it's about here. And if we take a quick look at the second balloon, it is still climbing and we are at 58,000, give or take 57. So let's go ahead and move this guy up. 
All right, so that's about where we are now. Um, I've been watching the aircraft, and I'm not seeing, at least on flight aware, I'm not seeing the second aircraft um, showing yet. Um, so this is a special message for the incident command post. Um, if the second aircraft is up, um, do me a favor, have them radio in to air traffic control and do flight following. Um, this way we can get their track online. Um, that'll be, that'll be good for us to see. Um, and they may not have gone up. They may have been waiting for the second balloon to be coming down further. Um, let's see. Yeah. You know, so, um, you know, Susan mentioned on the online chat, he does more than puzzles. He's still involved in flying and much more. Um, you know, we know of Colonel Joe here from his time, uh, with high altitude ballooning. The Colonel Joe story is so much more than that. I mean, like, you know, listen, if you live one lifetime and you did just the high altitude balloon thing, um, you would have lived a pretty awesome, um, you know, life. But the, the, the gentleman has been involved in aviation his entire life. Um, you know, he was a, a Vietnam fighter pilot. Um, we won't get into it here, but um, he actually was captured um and was at the uh, hanoi hilton for a long time um what is the cat plane id so um matt i've got two of them that we're tracking 606 charlie papa uh november 606 charlie papa if you're going to put it in flight aware too um and if anybody wants to you can do that um so november 606 charlie papa was our morning airplane and i'm assuming that um, our afternoon airplane is going to be november uh, 964 Charlie Papa. So 964 Charlie Papa. That's what I'm looking for um, for the second one. Um, let's see here. But he did so much more. And then even when he got back, right? So now you, you get the high altitude balloon, you got the fighter pilot, you got the, you know, um, uh, getting captured. I mean, that's enough for more than one lifetime, right? But no, you know, he doesn't want to be bored. Right. <laughs> so he goes out and he literally just like goes to tons of air shows. I don't even know how many flight hours he has. Um, it's just unbelievable. And, you know, he visited just an amazing amount of people. Right. So this isn't somebody that's just interested in aviation for themselves. He's somebody that goes out and really brings in other people into it. You know, the outreach. Um, what is the flight tracker? So um, I'm using flight aware. So Mike, if you, if you, you can download flight aware, you can do it on your, um, your, your, um, your mobile device. You can also do it on the website. Um, let's see here. So there was a question online. Um, actually let's see if we can bring in Jason. Cause I think Jason will have some good conversation here too. Uh, hang on a second. I'll, let me see if I can bring him in. Otherwise I'll just talk to you all day, <laughs> which I could do. Hey, how's it going? It's going good. All right, let me uh, reset the video here a little bit. Um, oh, you got it. All right, perfect. I won't do it on my side. All right, what I'm uh, going to try to do is... I, guess I just sat down. I've been trying you? to help all the different teams here. <laughs> well, we gave you just enough warning. Um, let's see here. I'm going to try to... Get my sets set up. Yep. What I'm going to try to do, and so folks are seeing this uh, live... Um, they're like, why are all the screens moving around? What I'm going to try to do is, <laughs> we're, you know, based on, this is based on your feedback online. <laughs> um, they wanted to see, you know, while we were talking, they want to see more of the tracking data. So with cool. Colonel Joe, Colonel Joe would absolutely take precedence over the tracking data. I tried showing it a little bit. However, when it comes to you and me, we're just boring, boring noobs compared to Colonel Joe. So we'll yeah. try to we'll try to make the um, the tracking data just a little bit bigger so you guys can all see that as well. Um, let me just so you're seeing the magic happen before your eyes. Uh, let's see we'll make that bigger there and we'll make this bigger here and we'll go here. All right. See look at that. We we respond to our community and <laughs> what they want. Um, 
Yeah. So you know, so one of the one of the comments, um, uh, I just it looks like it's uh, SRM. I'm not sure who the, whose name that is, but SRM made an interesting comment. Um, it looks like um, there was you know a little wind having effect um, on it. You know, and, and I think that's probably true. Um, it's not like a kite. You know, it is a balloon. So that it, it's it's um, it's so when we say wind, right? So wind is what we feel, right? Because we're standing stationary in a moving body of air, right? And so we call that moving body of air against us wind. But the balloon would feel no wind. It's in Correct. the moving body of air. So yeah. So. Another way to think of it is that the balloon is just another molecule that's in that wind. And so if you look at the spin rate and you look at the turbulence, even though it's going, I, I didn't look, but like 60, 70 miles an hour, um, the balloon is almost perfectly still. And that's because it's in an air mass. It's a molecule and that's the ground speed that it's traveling. And so sometimes in the winter, you'll see over 200 miles an hour. So those little boxes can go faster than an Indy car uh, or, or a Cessna. I don't know what the stall speed is on a Cessna, but like, you know, those little boxes, they uh, take off. And yeah, so that's a good point there that um, it doesn't feel much wind, but it's in that body that just moves across the, uh, moves across the earth. Yeah. Yeah, and a Cessna is um, the uh, flaps down stall, stall speed is about forty, about forty knots, forty five knots, depending on certain things. So about wow. fifty five miles an hour. Um, so people always ask the question, you know, can you land um, an airplane on a highway? Well, we don't recommend it. <laughs> Your engine shuts down. And the only thing in front of you is a highway and trees on both sides, and there's an opening. You can actually fly down, go past the cars. Uh, so this way you, the cars can see you and then and then start bringing your nose up, slow down. This way the cars behind you will slow down with you and you don't have to touch down, you know, until you're going 55, you know, 55 miles an hour. So, um, wow. all right. So let's go ahead. Um, one of the questions we had earlier, and I'm going to try to go back to it, um, is the, the, the dent, the width of the, um, the balloon, how thick is the balloon? Uh, the material itself or you know the the sphere size of the whole thing um the uh let's go with the th well let's do both the, th the thickness of the rubber itself uh man i wish i had something but like okay so this is a paper towel and there this is folded in half but it would be probably as thick as you know, one sheet of paper towel as the the main part of the balloon, which is uh, latex. And um, it has unbelievable stretching properties. And essentially what happens is that when we put the helium in the balloon um, on the ground, it's about six, seven feet across, um, as you could see, but it, it elongates, you know, um, because it wants to take off. The top part of the balloon is wanting to lift off and the payloads are holding the bottom, you know, holding it to earth and it just wants to take off. But actually when you let it go, it gets to be more of a sphere shape um, as it's flying. And um, essentially what happens is that it's the ideal gas law, but this, the simple version of it is there's helium molecules on the inside and there's air molecules on the outside of the balloon. And as we go up um, in, in altitude, the molecules spread apart or it becomes less dense. And so the same amount of helium in the balloon needs to match basically the molecule distance. And so it starts making the balloon grow and grow uh, because it needs to match the density of the air. And then when the latex can't stretch anymore, whatever altitude that is, it will burst and then starts falling back um, to earth on the parachute. Very cool. All right. Um, I am thinking that oh, this would be really cool for the ground team. Um, I'm thinking that first balloon may be on the ground. Um, so it is, uh, is... 1,300 feet. I mean, I'm sorry, 13,000 feet. Um, you might have needed to refresh the, the graph there. Okay, let me um, try. 
And uh, yeah, it is. Uh, well, actually, I just refreshed it. Eight thousand. Got it. We just got another one. Six thousand, unless my internet's slow. Yeah, six thousand seven hundred feet. Yep. So within probably the next, um, you know, three four minutes, especially if this is a minute or so behind, within the next three or four minutes, this should yes. be on the ground. Um, That's correct. So now let's take a look. I'm gonna make. I'm gonna. I'm gonna have you on the audio, Jason. But I'm gonna make your face go away. So, okay. Sounds um, good. Just like how your wife would want when she's mad at you. <laughs> so, or <laughs> um, let's see here. Let's go to the, the balloon tracker. All right. So if we take a look, this looks like it's going to land in the Indiana Soldiers and Sailors Children's Camp area near Six Mile Creek. So well, good spot. How fast is it going horizontally, though? Well, let's take a quick look at that. Let's see if we can tell. Um, let's see, speed. This is where your math needs to be speed math, you guys. Yeah, so it's saying 10 miles an hour. So 10 miles an hour. And it's only going to have another three or four minutes? Yeah. So you're looking so, at 0 0.05. So you're looking at, yeah, you're not looking at very much. You're looking at maybe another 200 yards, give or take. Yeah. Now, you know what's interesting is if we look at this track together, right? That track, it was going, you know, southeast. And right when it got lower to that ground, it picked up that second air mass that's lower to the ground. And again, very similar to when we took off, right? When we took off, we were in that lower air mass and it went almost due north. And it got above, we'll figure out later, but it was about 13,000 feet, I think it was, somewhere in that range, 13, 15,000 feet. And the balloon literally did like a U turn. Um, you're right, and it, it kept traveling. Well, we'll take a look here. And it traveled almost due south and then it got into some other kind of air mass up closer to the stratosphere yep. and it all of a sudden jumped west very clear lines right um, i expected these to be much smoother and they, that's i mean that's a very abrupt change um and then all of a sudden i mean talk about abrupt it just went like from west to southeast like almost like on a nose dive um and then as we get down lower uh, we see it now as it got back into that lower air mass again, that 13,000 foot air mass, whatever it is, it went almost, you know, spun right around again and it went back almost north, just like we saw during the launch. So, yeah, that, hey, Bob, do you yeah. want to put it on satellite mode and uh, see if we can see what kind of tree it's going to land in? Um, sure. How do I do that? Let's see. Oh, satellite. Uh, there we bottom, go. I got bottom you. right. Oh, it looks like we're going to go to field. I think it'll cross the road there. Yeah. Uh, for, we're at fourteen hundred. It might even be on the ground in real time, but it'll it'll update us. Uh, and in the in the upper right, it'll tell us if it's on the ground. And that little icon will change once we get a ground packet. Okay. Very cool. Um, all right. So to our incident command post, um, I'm as, I'm assuming that the ground team is already on its way, um, but I think you've got. Oh, I think there you go. Is that the icon you were looking for? Let's see. Mine is not refreshing. It's, a, it's the little, um, the little pin, the map pin. Oh, okay. Okay. We haven't gotten that yet. Um, all right. So yeah, so it looks like we'll probably be, we are going to be in a field. So that's good. I was very nervous. We were going to be landing in a prison yard and like some guards would be running out thinking we were dropping something in there. We're not supposed to. So, um, so I'm really happy to see that. Um, let's take a quick look at our second balloon. Um, our second balloon looks like it's tracking just slightly north. Now it was literally laying right on top of the other, uh, balloon. So let's take a look at the vertical on that one um it's now at seventy thousand feet it's still going up um so let's go ahead and adjust this guy up here just a little bit more and we're going to take this one all the way down because i think we're just about on that ground if not already i'm so excited for this you know i i was hoping we were all hoping um that we'd be able to show you video footage of the ground team when they get there and the drones um so, but, but because it's an Air Force assigned mission, we can't do that. Um, but we are going to have all that footage and I'm super excited for you all to see, um, uh, you know, that video uh, with all of that activity. Because again, like how we showed the, the much larger team in Florida, um, there's, a, there's a really big team in Indiana that's doing this, this mission with us. 
Um, let's see here. With that, actually, Jason, I don't know if you can switch to your phone. Uh, did you want to show us? Maybe you could take us into the internet command post and the mobile. Is I, would, I think recovered? I got to get approval. I don't know if um, if if they're okay with that. I gotta I gotta talk to them. Sure, sure. And whatever um, they agree with there is fine with me. Um, yep. Yeah. So I might be able to pull some of them in once, uh, especially once we get you know um, all the different teams going in the right direction. Yeah, they're probably pretty busy right now. Every effort. Yeah, speaking um, of which, let me see if that airplane, if I can show the airplane yet. Um, still not seeing the airplane's track. Uh, let's see here, 606. Yeah, I'm still not seeing the airplane. Uh, my assumption either they had something happen with the airplane so they couldn't use it, um, or it's just not being tracked for some reason. Uh, I'm not sure what's well, going on there. They you know, I went down there and uh, told them, you know, a timeline, and um, they said, you know, um, it it wouldn't take them very long. I, I they might be all prepped and ready to go. They might be sitting there. Cool. They said after takeoff, it would take minutes to get down to that area. Yeah. So how far um, how far away is this? So would you say for miles total flight miles? Um, so uh, you know, let me. I mean, I don't know. Well, where is Let's it? Is it Carthage? So we can figure yeah. we can figure this out. Hang on, since we're not tracking the airplane yet, let me switch over to. Well, actually, I got it on the data here. Um, go to um, the data tab, and then um, make sure the red balloon is highlighted. Okay. The data tab in the top, so we're and then the data. Um, well, so yeah, graphs data. And then down in the lower right there, distance traveled in miles, 23.9. Oh, cool. Man, look at that. That is so cool because that you, we, you, you nailed it. Like that, that program nailed it. Because we, we said earlier, we said between 22 to 25 miles. We, ex we expected yep. that travel distance to be. And, and it was right on, you know, 24 miles. Yeah. So that- Let me, really uh, if, I don't know if I can share through the live stream here, but- um, uh, let's see. I can show the flight track here for, for our flight forecast tools. Let me see. All right, I'm going to... I hope we don't break the internet. I'm going to go ahead and share <laughs> my screen. All right, let me pull you back up so people can see what you're seeing. All right, we can, we can see what you're showing. Now, okay. um, keep, your, keep your stuff that you're going to show a little bit yep. to the left side of your screen. Because I'm okay. cutting off the right side of your screen, because that's where all like the Skype v windows are. This is uh, not my laptop. It's like uh, it's <laughs> it's okay. driving. It's like really crazy to drive. We can we we can see that though. Good. We can see it good. It's coming across good. Okay. Okay. So um, so this is a flight forecast. This is a tool that I built. Uh, with the team, and we actually worked on all of the algorithms and equations back in 2014. And then, um, actually, an international team that I worked with, um, we put this together so that uh, you can basically not launch blind. So this was a track uh, this morning. So um, you know, we can go up here to Anderson. And you can see where we took off and. You know, I don't know if you want to go take the flight track there and uh, screen and screen and show them the takeoff, see how similar it is. Just go zoom in uh, on the takeoff there of uh, the Stratostar software. So it's a little bit different shape, uh, you know, versus uh, the forecast, but pretty, pretty close. Yeah, it's pretty good. And then um, if we go down and look at the landing area, um, essentially, you know, we have a lot of factors and variables that go into, um, you know, putting these flight forecasts together, right? So is the weather going to change? Did you put in as much helium as you told this model? Um, you know, the guy that, or the person that built that balloon that day, did they have a good day and, you know, make it go a little bit higher or did they have a bad day? And, you know, the factory was too warm and it burst a little lower. So you have these two, you know, we obviously put a point on the ground but then um, you have these two rings, and I think it's about two miles and then five mile radius. And when we're planning a mission, this is kind of how we gauge, like, are you okay with it landing anywhere in these concentric circles? All right. 
uh, a lot of people will zoom in on that little dot and say, you know, I, I wish that it could land on this side of the road or <laughs> right. something like that. And there's no way we can control it like that. Um, but the best we can do is be like, are we okay with everything, you know, in this circle? Um, so like if there was like mountains on half of it or, a, you know, a big lake like Lake Michigan or ocean, um, you probably wouldn't want to do it. Um, the prison, the prison yard. Exactly. I mean, <laughs> there's probably a prison yard in there somewhere, but you know, the statistics of it landing in there is so small, but, um, you know, we said South here, you know, Carthage, Westland, and I think it landed slightly South might even be in this first circle. I don't know if you want to take a look at that track. Yeah, I've got it up. So we might be just outside that first circle. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Somebody's practicing the bugle. Yeah, it's somebody's phone. I'm kind of in the middle of everything here. <laughs> um, but uh, you know what? I mean, yeah, I think we're inside that first circle. 300 South, um, Westland and Carthage. So that was pretty good. That was, uh, you know, weather was pretty stable. Um, so, yeah, we're in the inside circle, which is kind of like a bullseye today. And so we'll see how the green balloon does today. Um, I think it's going to land a little bit north as, you yeah. know, we, we see it's tracking slightly north. Um, so it might come in a little short. We probably have about 10 to 12 minutes left on the green balloon before it pops. Um, and yeah, we're still waiting for that last packet on the red balloon. Um, once it gets on the ground, we built all this technology from the ground up because uh, going to the edge of space is one of the harshest environments that, that we can access. Uh, you know, you probably talked about it earlier with Colonel Joe. But, you know, minus 40 degrees, you know, Celsius or, or Fahrenheit in the middle of the summer, um, almost no pressure or oxygen up there. Um, and the other thing, I don't know if you mentioned it, but, you know, everything on the ground here, like um, our computers and, you know, a lot of electronics rely on air to take heat away from um, the electronics while they're doing work. Everything heats up, the batteries send energy through and it makes things work. But when you send stuff to the edge of space, um, we can't rely on you know, air cooling to really help us out much. So we need to be really careful that um, the things that we fly are, are you know, not too heat, you know, don't heat up too much just even in the normal atmosphere. And then I really protect everything from the sun because um, we're above the, the entire atmosphere, 99% of the atmosphere. And um, essentially, that sun just bakes everything that it touches. Uh, just like if you're sitting inside your house next to the window and it's sunny or in the car, um, that sun just blasts everything. And you, you had overheating problems before, but then the sun is exposed to the sun. It just continues to warm it up. And then, um, you know, if it's electronics, it'll probably, you know, heat fail, just like my phone did on the live feed earlier. Um, so you want to really shield things from the sun. Cool. I'm trying to figure out where my map here. We're going to be down here. There we go. Carthage. There it is. All right. So that's roughly where they're going to be. All right. Good, good deal. All right, um, let's see here. We had some other questions. Oh, the, what was that question? Um, somebody asked it when you were launching and I said, well, have to come back to it. I'm trying to remember what that was now. Do you remember what it was? I was whispering in your ears. I think that uh, they were talking about what is the technology that we use? For the tracker, that's right. Yeah. yeah. So um, I started this company in 2006 and the um, people I was working with, um, they were launching balloons, you know, in the early 2000s. And back in the day, you know, we had what's called line of sight radio. So um, the balloon would have a, a, a radio and some sensors and a big antenna. And then the, the chase vehicles 
would have uh, an antenna hooked up to a laptop and um, you know software displaying it on the map. And it was awesome. Uh, I mean, you know, it was the, the cutting edge of 2006. And um, we, you know, because one university was doing it, and the story is that really I wanted to become an engineer, um, you know, after high school, but I went to Purdue, I went to these schools and said, hey, let's go. I want to, you know, I want to make some stuff. And they said, look, uh, where's calculus? Where's all this math classes you need to get into our engineering school? I said, well, look, it's not a problem. I'll just take the classes here and, you know, we'll get going. Let's build some things. And they said, that's not how it works. You're going to need to either have taken that in high school or go to community college for a year or so and come back and see us and we'll see. And, you know, when you look back on it, I wouldn't need to know I needed to be in a math track in middle school in order to get calculus over with before um, getting into college. And so a little bit of problem solving, I said, look, you know, I still want to work for Raytheon, Boeing, um, aerospace. And what if I went into business side and, uh, you know, went and helped, you know, with the airplanes and all this, the fun stuff. And so I was at Taylor University um, here in Indiana, just north of here, actually. And they were building actually space satellites and they needed a way to test it out. And so they had put this radio and the antennas and the kids launched it um, for the first time ever using film cameras, Captain Bob. Mm -hmm. Okay. No, no SD cards in there, film <laughs> cameras that had to advance. And then they had to go to Walgreens on the way home and develop their film. I mean, it's amazing. So uh, they, they recovered this balloon as a part of their satellite testing. And that's where it came from. I was a student and the kids at the university just couldn't get enough. And they said, can we fly more? Why did this happen? Um, they were flipping heads in the textbook. And the professor had never seen a learning experience um, where kids wanted to know more information about the classes. Um, so anyways, uh, he said, we should get it out to some other students. And um, I, you know, they had one of these uh, trackers and I, you know, figured out a way to make another one so that we could get another university set up. And, and you know, it was a very painful process to make each one at the beginning. And then luckily enough, you know, we, we got enough out there that we could change technology. And so now we use satellite based radios and uh, that's why we can get it to the Internet. And so uh, I was able to sit down on the second version and build it from scratch um, with engineers so that it met what the needs were for education um, and basically learning environments and make it easy so that uh, you know anyone with a web connection like this can jump on and see the tracking. And I, I'm, I am very sorry that we weren't able to release this tracking link you know, out there. Um, however, after the live feed, Captain Bob, you can go ahead and um, you know, we can release this link and you guys can take a look at all the data um, out there and, and click around just like we are. But uh, it's, we're not Twitter or Google. And so when <laughs> right. the amount of people cap has involved, if each one of them, you know, or even half of them tried to come to the website during this experience, um, we don't have the resources on our servers in order to, to take that traffic. Um, so anyways, all that being said, um, we, I got to build it from scratch to make it easy to track and put up and create a great experience like this online. Um, and then make everything reusable. And so once it gets back, you just charge it up. You could fly it the next day. I think our record is uh, four days in a row with the same equipment. I'm just charging it overnight and going out and launching it again. Very cool. Um, let's see. We had a couple questions. I answered them in the chat, but I'll, I'll answer them here. From as far as altitudes, uh, looks like blue number two is just crossing the 80,000 mark. Um, and if we took a look at the graphs, I'm going to talk about this, this time and temperature one. I love this temperature one. Uh, so we're going to talk about that. Um, cause this is something you see in the books, but you know, especially for pilots, but you know, uh, you're talking about the temperature differentials at the different altitudes, but you don't see it like in real time. So that's pretty cool. So we're gonna talk about that in a second. Well, you know what, Captain Bob, why yeah. don't you go ahead in that graph, uh, in the upper right, do it versus altitude. Oh, you can do it here. Oh, there it is. Yeah, that's what I want. All that's right. the that's the textbook graph right there. 
and that is, um, um, you know, what we talk about for aviation, uh, the troposphere. So where that little kink is um, in the top, that's where basically all the weather lives underneath that. And where we see that kink to the right, so where it warms up, that's the beginning of the stratosphere. Very cool. And, um, you know, with balloon number seven specifically, I think that, you know, number two is what you were looking at, right? Um, let me see if I can get it up. Yeah, there we go. Um, yeah, and so, uh, you know, everything below 50,000 feet is the clouds and the weather. And then that's another layer of the atmosphere uh, when you see that. And then um, number five, um, the reason we're seeing that the, the little reflection of the graph, um, and now this is a, you know, this is some more of the advanced science, aviation science. And if you guys love this, you guys like drones, you guys like a aviation, there is a place for you in aerospace industry, okay? If you, you know, maybe you aren't, you know, your grades weren't the greatest. We need a lot of people in all of the industry to put everything together, okay? You don't have to go to aerospace engineering school to be on some of these cool projects. We need technicians and electronics. We need people running the, the mills uh, for aluminum. You can be a part of aerospace just like everyone else, all right? But uh, let me tell you about this graph. So as, as you know, um, the density of the molecules on the way up, it goes down. The pressure goes down. I think Captain Bob talked about that. Our little temperature sensor, how it works in temperature is actually measuring the movement of um, the particles, the energy. So the, the warmer it is, the faster the particles move. So a temperature sensor is actually kind of complex in, in what we're actually measuring. But in order for temperature to be accurate, it needs to bump into enough molecules to get that reading. And the, the difficult thing with the balloon is that it's going up at a fixed rate, 1,000 feet per minute. And as you go up, you don't get to bump into enough molecules um, just because of the, the air is getting thinner and thinner. And so when the balloon is coming down quite fast, the temperature sensor hits a whole bunch more molecules and it actually becomes more accurate. And so that's why we see this temperature reading here in at 40,000 feet of uh, minus 40 degrees Fahrenheit. And so this, the temperature sensor actually gets better on the way down. Everything else kind of, you know, goes crazy. Oh, um, I see. I didn't get that at first. So the, yeah. So the, the little, the, the line with a lot of dots, is it, it's on its way up on the way because up. it's traveling, yep. it's climbing slower. And then the other line to the left is the, um, uh, the, the dots are further apart yeah. because it's descending faster. Correct. And so and you yeah, get so a the better line is up, the other line's going down. much okay, faster it. through the, air, the atmosphere. Okay, cool. Yep. All right, that's an awesome one. Yeah, th this is a cool one because even for the younger cadets out there, um, you know, us pilots have been flying for a long time. We see these types of graphs, but we really don't play with them because when am I going to fly to 100,000 feet, you know? Right. <laughs> um, so it's like, it's, it's cool. It's a question on some exam, some cap exam about, you know, the lapse rate, the FAA asks you for, for commercial pilots. But, um, but otherwise, you know, what are you ever going to use it for? So you kind of learn it, you pass your test and you forget about it. So it's really kind of really awesome to see it now in a hands-on practical way. Uh, I'll be honest with you on a personal geek perspective today, the whole day is awesome, but this was actually really valuable on a personal level to see it this way. This, this, cool. this really locks it in. That's cool. Uh, let me give you another mind, you know, melting, uh, example here. Um, if you take a look at, uh, why don't you go ahead and do, you know, uh, balloon number two, yep. because it's got clean on the way up yep. data. We've got balloon two you up Go now. ahead and do speed versus altitude. Speed versus altitude, All right. Speed versus altitude, cool, got it. All right, so, uh, you know, this, this is a little bit more advanced, you know, graphing, uh, but to me and, and Captain Bob, Graphs uh, are, are so valuable. They tell you so much information. It's like a picture. Uh, it's like if you guys have ever watched The Matrix, I know that that ages Captain Bob and I, <laughs> but they, they look at this code on the computer, right? If you could read computer code, 
And um, <laughs> that's kind of what a, a reading a graph is. It's, it's a, a, such a fun experience. So let me explain, explain this graph. So um, on the left side, we have altitude, okay? So imagine this is like we're looking at the side of a, a cheeseburger or, you know, uh, you know, a Big Mac or something, and we're, we're going to take a look at all the different layers, okay? So we cut that cheeseburger in half, and we kind of see what's going on. So down here on the lower left, you have zero and zero. So zero feet and zero miles per hour. And I let the balloon go and it started accelerating in the atmosphere. And, you know, at uh, 20,000 feet, it was already going 33 miles an hour. And there's a lot of zigzags in here. But um, at 38,000 feet, we were going 70 miles an hour horizontally. And that is the middle of what we call the jet stream. It is the river of air that's in the sky. Now, one of the most ridiculous things, I think, for, for aerospace and aviation is that's where all of our planes fly. It's pretty much in the craziest part of the atmosphere. Um, now, if, if you might not know this, but um, when you're flying in an airplane, and if you're from either coast, you may have experienced this, but um, going from the west coast to the east coast, your flight time across the country could be an hour shorter, 45 mm -hmm. minutes to an hour, because you're in that jet stream. Um, you are flying 500 miles an hour in 70 mile an hour wind, so your ground speed is 570 miles an hour. Um, and, and Bob, you know, maybe you can look this up, but there's actually airplanes that flew in the jet stream that went faster than the speed of sound, uh, passenger jets. Um, because they were pushing on air that was also going, you know, a couple hundred miles an hour. Hey, Jason, just hold off that one second. We'll come right back to sure. you. Just wanted to give a quick update to folks. So yeah, so we're at 90, we're over 90,000 now. All um, right. So it, it's balloon two has, looks like it's beating balloon one. Um, and the other really cool thing is if those of you that are seeing the live stream up at the top now, we have November 606, Charlie Papa is now on flight aware. It took off a few minutes ago. Um, and it is tracking very quickly to where um, the air, the balloon is. Um, and they are currently at 3,000 feet and going about 120 knots. So they are going at full cruise speed to that, to that balloon landing. Awesome. Cool. Sorry, go ahead. Very Continue, cool. sorry. No, that's great. Yep. So, uh, so anyways, uh, that's the, the jet stream. And so it zigzags back and forth. Uh, in intensity, and, and I guess balloon number two is really taking off. Um, you would think there's not much wind up there, but, uh, you know, it, it's already up to 50 miles an hour last time I checked. Yeah, um, let's see here. I have like five people pinging me up different things, so sorry, folks. Um, all right, so one of the questions was how high did balloon one get to? And it looks like it topped out about 88,000 feet, if I'm looking at this right. Uh, well, actually, you could tell from the data, right? So if I go data tab, um, will it tell me the exact Well, that there? gives the, the most current. The graph oh, okay. is probably the best. And if you hover over it, yeah, it was 87,621 feet. Now, that's internet data. Yep. So we send data every minute, okay? So each dot is a minute. But on board, we have a black box, just like an aircraft and we're logging data every few seconds. And so um, there's a possibility we could see a little bit higher data on on, on there, but it's gonna be probably pretty close to that. All right. And then um, we're at I guess about 95 uh, you know, whoever built our balloon, number two on that day, they were having a great day, 94,000 feet so far. Uh, I don't think that we'll see 100, but you never know. All right, we're gonna, all right, so this is where Captain Bob tries to make a little money on the side. So Jason, what's, you're a betting man. Let's put our quarter in place. So <laughs> where, where do you think that the top's going to be for, for your quarter? I mean, it, it, uh, let's see, did we, Oh, 95,000. Uh, so you're still at the data trying to like fine tune no, your well, answer. Uh, hey, you know what? We got to <laughs> take all the, the factors in. Let's go. I'm going to go 98,000. 98,000. All right. Internet chat room. What do you all think? What's what's your quarter bet gonna be? <laughs> I want all the quarters when we're done. I, I demand you send them to me uh, if I win. Um, I'm gonna, you know what? I'm gonna say one hundred thousand and one feet. 
I'm going all in. Joe's the expert, so I'm sure he's gonna win. But is this like the Price is Right thing, where it's the you you, you, you can't go over? <laughs> yeah, one one foot, one foot. I want the one foot over. <laughs> so, yeah. um, but yeah, hey, it's uh, getting there. Yeah. So, um, yeah, we'll see. We'll see what happens. Let's uh, see what we get. An update. Um, now it's interesting. It has not made that southern track yet because you know why? Because it's still in the upper app. It's still in that stratosphere. Longer. Uh, correct. So it's it going to track the, more um, west. It is, it is, uh, and it kicked up speed, um, you know, and, and I'll tell this to everyone listening. We don't know much about what happens over 60,000 feet. Um, from a, from an aviation standpoint, there's very few aircraft that go over there, um, above that. And, um, as we continue to build more aircraft, uh, we need to fly higher. The air is, is much thinner. Um, the jet stream is not as crazy, so we could actually save a whole bunch of fuel um, if we were able to fly a little bit higher. And we need your help um, in order to figure out what's happening up there. So, like, even this jet stream, it's kicking up speed on balloon number two. There's not a whole lot of people um, in the world that can, you know, that know exactly why there's another jet stream and what's going on up there because as humans we care about the weather on earth and really the troposphere where the clouds are is right next to us and um you know we don't know much about how the winds up in the upper atmosphere influence what we do down here but it's it's a really it's a mystery actually uh, we got to figure it out so i am going to put into the chat um i don't know if the folks in the incident command post already have this but here is Looks like the, the for the aircraft. For, here is the GPS coordinates of Balloon One. Um, I see that they're tracking there now. Um, let's see, is it cleared for landing at KIND? Oh, I'm sure. <laughs> so, um, let's see here. I think that this is so incredible that you know, just in the last couple of years, we have the technology to talk all across the country. We can track balloons that are going up to close to, and the, the internet is with me, Jason. They think it's gonna break 100,000. <laughs> oh, you know what? I might've lost the bet already. Did you? Uh, yeah, I mean, it goes up, oh no, oh, 97,000. Right you know what? It may have burst. If we don't get an no. update for uh, a couple minutes, right. it might be on its way down. All right, well, we have, uh, we have a couple, we have one person, let's see. So Taylor Aerial Photography, Taylor, if you do aerial photography, I'm assuming with a name like that, I want to see some of your pictures. Um, maybe next time we can get you to go too with the cap airplanes and do some video for us. Um, let's see here. You said 98,000. So I don't know if we do the price is right thing. You went over, so you may be out of it. Uh, um, but you know, you might be the closest. We'll have to see. I don't know, man. That's right close to that, that thousand. Let's take a look at the data real quick. Um, data on number two. And uh, it's showing 98,606. So let's see what happens. Um, very cool stuff. All right. I'm also with tracking the airplane. It's still heading there. So that's looking good. Yeah, man. What a fascinating time to be alive. You can just do it. We could track an airplane in real time and track a balloon that goes up to the edge of space in real time. Just absolutely amazing. Um, let's see here. All right. I think that's good. Um, Jason, do we have anybody that could go uh, for you, um, over to the instant command? Post. They may be too busy with coordinating ground teams. They may not want to be bothered, and I totally get that. Um, uh, see if um, maybe if they can let somebody in there with a phone just to kind of see what they're up to. Um, yeah, let me see luck. if there's somebody around. They kind of it's kind of cleared out. Everybody's out there in the field, you know, doing the fun stuff. Yeah, right. So I'll be right back. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna go just to me for a second then. Um, let's see here. Let me go to the balloon tab. All right, so, all right, so let's update this. So let's see, 99,770. I think we're gonna do it. We got an update. We're, we're right at that 100,000 mark. Let's do this. Um, all right, we're definitely on the ground now, so we'll put that one all the way back down. All right, so, so cool. Um, any idea on the status of November 94 Charlie Popper? It looks like that one didn't go. Um, it looks like um, it's going to be cap 1206, which is 
um november 606 charlie papa um so that's the one that's back up so the same one they used earlier is the one that they took up now now here is what i'm hoping and i don't know um the incident command post is very busy um they are coordinating a lot of activity uh, i know you all are seeing me and hearing us um but the incident command post there's an entire team of people in there and they're very busy so um so they may not know themselves but my hope is that they're re reusing 606 because maybe they wanted to put more people in the airplane again 606 if my understanding is right is a ga8 and a ga8 i think can hold 11 people as opposed to a cessna 182 which usually holds between three and four depending on the size of you i am six foot eight 280 pounds so uh you know if you put me in the the 182 there's not going to be very many other people in the airplane um the ga8 holds a lot more people a lot more um weight um so they may have taken that back up um just so they could get more people in the airplane um yeah, we'll, we'll find out hey uh hey jason yeah are you seeing the data no i haven't looked here in a minute i got someone from uh uh Come in to, to talk to everybody and tell you, give you some updates. Awesome. But real quick before we do that, as you're sitting down, uh, sir, um, we got our loaded, our latest GPS data shows 100, 1,847 feet. We broke 100,000. Wow, that is amazing. <laughs> That's amazing. Broke 100,000. Yeah, that is awesome. Well, no, congrats, no offense to balloon everybody. One. Uh, you know, we, we picked a good balloon 120, today. 100,000. I wasn't three. expecting that. So awesome. That's awesome. So who do you have with us? Uh, do you need to pull my video back up? Or yep, I'm going to bring it back I, up. Uh, okay. I can up oh, there you go. So, you know, just uh, introduce yourself and just give us a little update from, you know, central command. Sure. Um, we, my, my name is major Bill Vendraman uh, from the civil air patrol, great lakes region. Uh, we have right now the second airplane is getting ready okay. to get in the air and head down to where the first balloon cool. headed. Right. And, um, of course the ground team's already been dispatched. They had left okay. quite a while ago. Great. So the ground team, I'm assuming the ground team should be there any moment now. Okay. And then the air crew will catch up with them. But the, of course the air crew will only take them 10 minutes. Yeah. To get to minutes. Them. So yes, yeah, so we have a ground team in route, it's more than likely there now. And then we have the air crew that's uh, leaving Anderson Municipal Airport cool. at this moment. Can you tell us, you're not just calling them on the cell phone. Can you tell us, <laughs> no. I saw outside, there's a whole bunch of stuff that got built outside. Can you tell everybody about how you're doing communications and why you don't just call people on cell phones? Yeah, well, the cell phone issue is a bit of a distraction. Um, so we don't want people to be distracted in the airplane. And there's infrastructure in the airplanes and on our ground teams so that they could communicate via radio. Okay. Right. And we have a nationwide communication system. So communicating from, you know, here, um, in Anderson Preparatory Academy to, you know, say anywhere in Indiana is a, a fairly basic thing for us. For so us a walkie talkie. A walkie talkie. Can call <laughs> all of Indiana. Yes. Wow. And if we needed Ohio and Illinois and. And, right you know, I guess else. if you're doing a, you know, a rescue mission, um, or, or there's a disaster in an area like hurricanes and things that you probably work in, you can't get, there isn't a cell phone. And so right. you've got to have your own gear in order to communicate, right? Yes. And that, that's why we do that is because in, a hurricane is a good example where the infrastructure, the cellular service infrastructure could be out. Yeah. And if the cellular service infrastructure is out communicating via cell phones, not going to help. Well, let me give you a quick update. I saw, I'm looking at the tracking. Hey, Captain Bob, if you can hear us, I think we got burst on the uh, first balloon. Is that correct? On the second balloon. That's correct. Second balloon. Yep. Yep. It's coming, it's back coming down. down. It's coming down. Um, Great. Major. What, what did it reach? What was the max? I saw a hundred through almost a hundred and four thousand. Holy wow. cow. So that's awesome. You know, one of the questions online, uh, Jason was what's the highest you've seen? Uh, so my personal record, which I was, I had some bigger balloons, but we ended up, the student projects were too awesome. I couldn't put the bigger balloon on because it would add more weight. Um, but I have gone to 116,000 feet. Wow. 
uh, myself. Uh, and then, you know, I think the record, um, you'll have to look it up, but the, the high altitude balloon record is 53 kilometers by a Japanese group wow. using a really specialized balloon. But, uh, yeah, over a hundred thousand is, is kind of a little bit rare and special. And, you know, if you're above 120,000, that's a whole another level. But at that point, you're, you're, you're just trying to get it up there. You're not doing a whole lot of science. It's got to weigh, you know, kind of, kind of light weight. So, uh, so just for, for those of us that aren't used to doing kilometers, that's about 150,000 feet, right? Yeah. So that's pretty amazing. It's, it, it's unbelievable. Um, and hopefully today, even today, um, we'll be able to share out some pictures, uh, of what it looks like, um, from these altitudes. And then, um, we'll also, um, you know, I'm sure that we're going to put a video together from this channel for civil air patrol, kind of a highlight video. Uh, each balloon had three cameras that hopefully they all worked, or at least some of them worked and we'll be able to put a good, you know, good video together. Yeah. And, he, yeah, and, nice. and yeah, like civil air patrol to help, um, the community and the public, you know, find people, rescue people, or, you know, you guys have done delivery of vaccines to remote yes. areas, Yes. you know, all kinds of things. Yeah. We just did that recently from Minnesota down to Michigan. Wow. Mm -hmm. So cool. Yeah. So, uh, you know, we'll try to, do you have any updates? So from, from in there that we might not know about the ground teams have left. Yep. Ground teams have left. Um, the air crew is, uh, well, by the time that I walked down the hallway, they should have been departed. Okay. So they were getting ready to, they were supposed to depart at one o'clock. There was a little bit of delay, but they, they, okay, I think cool. they should be in the air by now and probably right. over the ground team. Okay. Because cool. of the short, you know, it only takes five minutes for them to get there. Yep. And so if, if, uh, you guys don't know, you know, on the internet there, um, Indiana is pretty much covered with corn and bean fields. Um, there's very little trees, you know, in the North part of Indiana where we've landed. And so, uh, the corn is over eight feet tall. You could actually drive a vehicle in a corn yes. and it'd be taller than the vehicle, right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, right now, especially right now, the corn's kind of, you know, hitting its peak and it's everywhere. So the, if the balloon falls down through the corn stalks, yeah. it may be a little harder yeah. to find. Yeah. So it's, it's almost like uh, finding something in the dark because you're, you're really, there's so much stuff happening um, with the corn that you can't see literally more than a couple feet in front of you and the side of you. Yeah. And so we take the GPS and we plug it into, um, you know, a handheld GPS and you can walk out to the coordinates um, that you're mm -hmm. looking for. So, yeah. yeah. So I'm pulling yeah, up. See, in, in, right. In this case, we have GPS coordinates, which, yep. are, which is nice. Yep. When we're doing an actual mission right. and it may be an airplane landing in a field, yeah. You know, it tends to take the corn stalks oh, down right. so you could see it. Yeah. But in this case, we have GPS as a plus. Yeah. yeah. But the fact that it's kind of dropping in yeah. is it's makes a, a good harder. it's a it's a good exercise today to see uh, yeah. you know what we can do. Mm -hmm. So that's awesome. Yeah. I appreciate you coming down and hopefully we'll get some more updates uh, as we come, you know, get closer down to the ground here with the teams. Mm -hmm. Yeah. When, you know, the aviation the side will start communicating with the ground side. Cool. And we should be able so to So they can talk. Quickly. The airplanes can talk to the vehicles directly. Correct. Right? Oh, that's awesome. Mm -hmm. Well, we got the we got the dream team going here, Captain Bob. Uh, all thanks to Civil Air Patrol and uh, you know all the hard work that you and Susan put in to make this possible. Yes. Awesome. So thank you. And yeah, we got thank you. you know hundreds of people involved today. It's <laughs> awesome. Um, are you are you guys? Can you guys hear me? Okay. Yep. Okay. Cool. I wanted to give you an update. So the first airplane that we were tracking it was returning home so okay. we thought that that first airplane was the ga8 we thought that that was gonna that was going to look for it but that actually was returning home the other aircraft um we are now tracking it they lifted off about two minutes ago um, so they are now in the air um, they're at currently at 1600 feet so they're right at that limit for us which is great um, and they're at 125 miles an hour which is about cruise speed for a 182 on a hot day um, okay so very cool. So we're going to track them um, here. Let me go back. I got one question there for the major. Let's see here. All right. See here. Towards Mount Comfort. That's an area we know well. Cool. All right. So, well, so what, the track is going to be about the same. So when you go back over there, 
you can kind of you know predict where it might go like that. So green, same so angles, green stuff like that. So, anyways, what was the question, Captain Bob? We're we're excited about the tracks and yeah. the maps and the graphs here. So, so the um the track looks like it's going to be around Greenfield, I would say, somewhere in that yeah, area. Yeah, I'd say probably we're looking at uh, west of Greenfield. Um, is kind of what I'm thinking. Yep. So we'll have to see. All right, very cool. All right, so question for you, Major. So we talk a lot um, today about AE, and you know, I want to give a few shout outs. Well, we got a few minutes, uh, and I just also want to give a heads up to the folks in Florida. Um, it's longer than than you know, we, we kind of went long because we just like to talk too much. But um, I would say probably about another 10 to 15 minutes we'll, we'll meet back up with you in Florida. Um, once we know, once we see the airplane circling, uh, we won't be able to do footage from the local site at this point. We're going to get that later. Um, so once we know that they have acquisition, we'll probably wrap up the live stream because after that, it's just we're just wasting time with everybody. <laughs> um, but anyway, so, you know, AE, which is today's primary mission, right? Um, but we have our two other missions inside of Civil Air Patrol. There's a lot of people watching this, and you guys will be excited to hear this. We have over a thousand people watching right now online so wow, that is awesome yeah that is awesome yep um so very cool um and uh, again like and subscribe folks like and subscribe anyway, anyways done with that so <laughs> um we had for the those of you that aren't in cap and you're just finding this through some weird google thing right and you're just interested so you're watching along aerospace education is one of three missions for civil air patrol the other two are cadet programs um, where it's, uh, it's the youth from 14 to 21. Usually we get the folks um, out of high school. Usually they, they wrap it up, uh, but we do have folks that go through college with it. Um, and we also, our other main program is emergency services. So, so today's mission, the, the thought from the, very, from the very beginning was, yes, this is an aerospace program, but wow, this would be cool you know, six months or three, four, five months ago, we were thinking this when we were putting this together. This really can be an awesome program for everything. So as, uh, I'm sorry, Major, what was your last name again? Vendraman. Vendraman, sorry about that. So, um, so you know, Major Vendraman and the whole team there, you know, they're, they're, they've been focused on um, the emergency services side of this program. Right, as we've been focusing kind of on the aerospace side, they've been focusing on the emergency services side because this is a wonderful practice for them. Because if they get a tornado, they get our, I mean, I don't know how many hurricanes you're getting in Indiana, but. Uh, but yeah, those are few and far between. Thankfully, <laughs> um, you know, but any type of major activity that happens, right? Um, this is good practice for them. Let's take it away from Indiana. Let's take it to Florida. Let's take it to South Carolina, Georgia, um, Mississippi, um, you know, New Orleans, right? The, the cap units down there, I want to say, and somebody can correct me online from CAP if I'm over exaggerating or under exaggerating, but I think it's over 90% of the Air Force designated missions for search and rescue, rescue are actually performed by the Civil Air Patrol. Um, a lot of folks don't know that. And so a lot of folks in Civil Air Patrol, you know, the running joke is, you know, we're the best kept secret, you know, and I hate that comment because <laughs> it means we got to get the word out more. But, um, you know, we have the largest fleet of single engine aircraft in the world. Um, I still think that, no offense to our folks in Canada, I used to, I, I lived in Buffalo and right across the water from Canada. I think Civil Air Patrol's fleet of airplanes could probably take on Canada's Air, Air Force, I'm not sure. But <laughs> um, <laughs> but anyways, they, um, um, the, where I'm going with this is I want folks to understand that we have an entire, a really big, so for you guys, this is a really cool practice. Now you've been in the other room with folks at the incident command post. Um, give it, since we're not really able to get in there, can you kind of give us a, 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 a verbal representation of what it's like in there? Sure. It's, it's, it's basically team members working together, right? So you have uh, like air branch directors. Those are the individuals who are leading the aviation side of things, right? So they keep track of where the airplanes are and when they're going to depart and you know, what they're going to do. And they do the, the planning for that. And then there's a ground team, right? So there's a ground team element, and then there's an incident command, there's public affairs and safety and finance. And all of these entities are working together 
to try to coordinate the mission, right? So you may get a situation where, you know, our communications team is setting up infrastructure so that the air teams, air crews could talk to the ground teams. And it's just a, a, a large coordination of these individual elements, these individual team members who are there to, you know, accomplish the mission, right? In this case, it's trying to locate where the balloons land. And that's, that's what they're doing. So they're communicating to the ground teams and the air crew members and trying to get information pulled together. You know, this airplane's doing this and this airplane's doing that. And there's a safety element to it as well, right? Hey, we want this airplane to be over there and this airplane to be over there so that you could avoid conflicts, you know, with two air crews trying to find, you know, a balloon in the same location, right? We don't want airplanes to be two airplanes at the same place at the same time. So it takes a, a team effort to make that happen. And it, it's much like the military, right? Where when you're trying to move, you know, individuals in the military from point A to point B, you know, those individuals, they need a lot of resources. They need water and they need transportation. And it's the same here. It's just a lot of team members working together to try to accomplish a goal. And there's a incident command post, right? The ICP. So there's an incident commander who's leading the charge. And she's basically the one who's directing the traffic, right? And making sure that things happen in a, a unified way, right? That everybody's moving in the same direction. So this in particular uh, mission is, is fun for us mm -hmm. because A, it's a training mission, but it's also an aerospace education mission. Like you had mentioned, there's the aerospace education component, the cadet component, and the emergency service component of Civil Air Patrol. And today we're really doing all three. I mean, we're not really running a cadet program but cadets are here, they're involved, and certainly it's an aerospace education component, and then it's emergency services component with the air teams and the ground crews. So it's, it's one of those events where for us, it's really fascinating because we have all three of those components working together today. And yeah, that's awesome. That's, yeah, you know, that's on, the, on the cadet program side, you know, our conversations with Colonel Joe, um, you know, talking about his background, um, the leadership aspect. So, you know, I would say, you know, it's just a little bit of a, uh, cause we do have so many viewers and it's great. We're, we're well over a thousand now, um, today. And, you know, so for us, that's a pretty big audience. Um, we don't, we're not usually out there into the community that like this big. So this is great. Um, you know, so if you are somebody, you know, I know we point to the cadets, but the senior members as well, if, you know, I, I joined CAP and I wasn't, my kids aren't in CAP. If you asked my kids to stand and salute somebody, the, the comedy that would ensue um, <laughs> would be great. Uh, or, or to see or ask them to put on a uniform in March, it would be pretty funny. Um, so, um, so, so, you know, I joined CAP because I, I, I love it. I have a love for aviation and I have a love for, yes. for education. Um, so, you know, if you're somebody who's 12, 13, 14, 15 years old, you know, you want to get involved in aviation, you're not sure how, look us up. Um, there's a lot of great things. You know, if you're a senior member, I can tell you, um, and not everybody is different, and I'm not going to give you exact numbers because I'll probably get in trouble for it, but um, I can tell you that I'm a pilot for CAP and I fly a lot. Um, mm -hmm. To be honest with you, I hope my boss isn't listening to this because I probably, I, I can't tell you how many, like some people take sick days. I take CAP days. <laughs> so, yes. Uh, <laughs> um, I understand that. Hey, you know, last last weekend, one of the things that I did, because I'm, I'm a pilot as well, mm -hmm. one of the things I did last weekend that ties into the aerospace education component of this is right. I flew three aerospace education members in what we call teacher orientation flights, right? So awesome. I had the opportunity to take three teachers flying. Uh, how cool is that? That is super cool. You know, because mm -hmm. then, especially if you're a senior member, you're interested in aviation, not only are you giving a spark to a teacher, that teacher then is going to share that spark. So maybe you talk to those three people, you know, but those three people that could go out to 90 kids, you know, um, mm -hmm. you know, and so that, yeah, that's totally awesome. So, you know, again, I, one thing I want to point out for see, for folks that are adults, you know, um, we're getting the gray in our hair, right? Um, but it's not a flying club. 
right? So if, if somebody thinks they're gonna join CAP just to fly for free, and that's not what it is. You'll quickly burn out. It's not what it is at all. Um, but you know, your love of aviation ties into the greater mission of the country and emergency services. And, and it takes that love that you have for aviation and it turns into something that's beneficial for your, for your, for your neighbors, for your community. Um, so anyways, that's my sales pitch for Civil Air Patrol. Anybody who's interested in it, go check out gocivilairpatrol.com. Um, that, you know, and, and try to learn more and you can always leave. Oh, we're at, we're at 1400 people now watching. Um, really awesome. So, and that's not even some of the other platforms. That's just the one platform. So that's pretty great. Um, so anyways, long story short, go civil air patrol.com. If you're interested in it, um, let's see, uh, major Vendramen, anything else you wanted to maybe bring up about civil air patrol while we've got a few minutes and then we're going to probably head over to uh, Florida here in just about five minutes. Well, I got an update from, uh, from the ground captain Bob, but, but go ahead. Yeah. Well, I was just going to say that, you know, there's. The Civil Air Patrol, of course, has an aerospace component to it, right? But I have a lot of friends who are in Civil Air Patrol that don't necessarily have an aerospace component to what to the reason why they're in Civil Air Patrol, right? There's a lot of angles to Civil Air Patrol, right? Right now, they're at the incident command post. There's safety, finance, public affairs, right? Um, Air branch. Uh, if, you, if you're not a pilot, you could be a mission scanner, mission observer. There are a lot of angles to Civil Air Patrol. So if you're interested in aviation, and even if you're not interested in aviation, you know, yeah, take a look at the website. And uh, if you, you, know, you want to volunteer and be a part of a team that serves a good purpose for the community, we, you know, we'd love to have you. Awesome deal. All right. Well, Major, thank you so much for your time. We're going to get back yeah, to talking thanks. about the balloons. Yeah, thank come, you. Yeah. You know what? You. Come on back. Learn some more about what's yep. happening, and, and we'll have you back down before the end of the day. All right. Thanks. Yeah. All right. Thank hey, uh, Captain Bob, um, are you able to do a audio call and put it on the air? Um, I can put it on my cell phone and put the cell phone speaker next to my fancy dancy heavy duty microphone here. Well, uh, Michael Austin is. Um, he says he he hasn't seen it, but he is in the location of Balloon One, and the cab airplane is now circling. Um, and so he, you know, I said, would you be willing to, you know, talk on? He said, sure. So if you want to give him a call, um, he can tell you what he sees down there. Yeah, let me. Uh, let's do that. Um, and I do see. If for folks, let me pull it up real quick. Um, Let's me pull it up real quick. And I, I'm getting pinged on my phone from other folks watching going, yes, that is a great idea. <laughs> so we are definitely going to do that. Let me pull in real quick the uh, flight track um, while I give him a call. Hang on a second. Where's my flight track one? And that's going to be over here. All right. We now see the airplane that um, is searching for the balloon is circling. Um, so they either have seen it or they are now initiating a search pattern to look for it. Um, so we're gonna kind of keep an eye on them here. Let me take a, let me give, let me give Austin a call. All right, hang on a second. I'm gonna mute you just for a second. Hello, hello this is Jason. All right, so Jason is taking, oh, that was too loud, sorry. Um, Jason is taking a phone call. What we're gonna do is we're gonna give uh, Michael a call on the scene. So hang on one second. Uh, Jason, I muted you, but I'm gonna, you're unmuted now, so you can talk to us again. All right. Um, so let me, Jason, I, I talk to the nice folks for a second. I'm gonna put you back on the video and I'm gonna mute myself and give a call to him. All right, so you're back all on, right. I'm muted, it's all you. All right, guys, uh, you know, um, I'm going to take a look. He's got the uh, graphs up. If you could put the map back up, maybe. Yeah, there you go. Um, zoom in a little bit. So um, what you guys are seeing now is that the, the, the track down um, is going to be pretty similar to what you're seeing on um, for both balloons. And um, we're about 8,000 feet for uh, the the second balloon and it's going to cut north 
there and it's going to be uh, west of um, Greenfield. And there's still some bunch of farm fields and everything up there. Um, so that'll be interesting to watch. But I still cannot believe we made it all the way up there. Um, if you guys are interested, if this is exciting to you, um, we have a couple different ways that uh, you can get involved. Like we've already mentioned, uh, Civil Air Patrol, we hope that we can do a another mission like this and get even more squadrons involved um, and have a great time across all of the different uh, parts of Civil Air Patrol. And then uh, another way is that we do um, kind of open share missions just like this, um, where if you're a teacher- Hey, Jason, um, my apologies for interrupting yeah. you. Um, we have Michael Austin from um, Indiana on with us. He's part of the ground crew. And he was giving me a little bit of an update. And I told him to hold back because this way everybody can hear it. So Michael, where are you? What are you guys doing? Well, we are located just a little bit uh, on the other side of Cartridge. Uh, we can see the plane overhead, and they've communicated with the, the ground. Arrived just a few minutes after uh, the uh, aircraft uh, came overhead. And so they are now out coordinating with the proprietor of the property and uh, giving him a little bit of background of what the uh, mission is that they're doing and uh, getting permission to be able to enter his property to uh, search and find the, uh, the payload. Very cool, very cool. All right, so you guys, did you guys get a chance to see the balloon at all as it was coming down or probably not? No, actually we didn't, but, but uh, following the, uh, the tracking uh, device on uh, the internet, uh, I, I, I got out here fairly easy. Uh, now the hard part comes is to pinpointing the exact location. Very cool, very cool. Now, now you guys have a special piece of hardware that's relatively new for us at CAP for emergency services. We've been talking about them for a while. We've been trying to get the training up for a while, but it's just relatively recent. We've got some, and I am so sorry to this individual. Um, I try to make sure everybody that's um, doing incredible work at National gets the, the, the credit that they deserve. Um, and I'm, I'm, maybe Susan can find this out for me real quick. Um, but we have um, our SUAS teams. Um, so that's our, basically our drones. Now, what people need to understand when we talk a drone, we're talking different things at CAP than what you may think of as a drone. So we actually have fixed wing drones as well as rotary drones, like you would think of if you went the Best Buy. Um, so we have some drones that can stay airborne for very long times, um, like a glider. Um, and it, however, it's just remotely piloted. Um, now for today, we are using, um, what you would more likely think of a drone, um, almost like a, it's not a phantom today, but it's more along those lines. Um, but we actually have a SUA and we don't call them drones in civil air patrol. We call them SUASs. Uh, that's actually what the FAA calls them too. So we have those, we have that out there and we actually have a drone pilot. Um, that drone pilot has an observer with him for safety. This way, as the pilot is worried about flying the drone, the observer ensures that there's no other aircraft around. Um, there's no trees. There's no. There's no power lines. They're there as a safety uh, measure. I, I can tell you, as somebody who has um, flown into a building with a drone. Um, <laughs> as somebody who has, when I was taking drone footage of something, this is at my own house, so it's even more embarrassing, so I should have known better. I was backing up away from the house and it didn't pay attention to the fact that there was trees behind me and I backed the drone right up into the trees. Um, so that observer position, you know, some people think, oh, wow, that's gotta be a boring position. No, not at all. <laughs> that observer position is really important. Um, you know, so kind of what um, uh, Major Vendramen was talking about where you don't have to be a pilot to be a huge value to CAP, you know, the drone program is one of those areas. Um, you know, you can get really close to, if there's a search and rescue mission, you know, you know, one of the things we're doing today, right? We're looking for a drone. One of the missions we get a lot in CAP is to look for somebody lost in the woods, um, you know, to see if we can get an airplane up to see if we can find somebody, if we know they're wearing a yellow jacket or a white jacket, or hopefully they're not wearing a dark brown green jacket. <laughs> um, but if they're wearing, you know, a jacket, we can find, you know, we, that's one of the things we search for. And we have ground teams 
to help look for people in the you know in those wooded areas so this is a really awesome practice uh for the team today um michael anything you want to add um that i'm missing well actually uh captain bob my role is just an observer uh so i'm not part of the ground crew but it is it's a pretty fascinating process uh our drone operator is, is actually getting the, the drone up in the air, and his observer is there. They went through their safety checks. Uh, there's there's some people that are deployed, uh, seniors as well as cadets, that are uh, uh, starting to head out into the area where they think that the, uh, uh, the payload's at. So it's a pretty fascinating uh, process to observe. All right, that's awesome. Um, I see J Jason's waving on the side here, but he's also eating. So I'm not certain if he just ate something hot. <laughs> And he's trying to be like, oh, my gosh, somebody get me some milk. Or <laughs> if he's saying he wants to talk. Like at all today. It's all balloons all day. <laughs> all right. I will let you go then. Awesome. Well, hey, do me a favor. Um, call back to me when you, you know, if you guys actually find it on the ground. Okay, we will. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much. And we want to give a shout out. Uh, Susan was able to find it for us. So for today, our SUAS pilot's name is Lieutenant Vincent Cannon. So um, he is one of our, our, our drone aviators today. Um, Jason, I want to get back over to Colonel Joe, because we've had him out there for a while, um, to get his take on this. Is there anything you wanted to add before we reach out to Colonel Joe? Go ahead. Uh, I'm going to have lunch. It's just, uh, you know, you guys are awesome as Cap, you know, being down there so quickly. And uh, we're going to recover this for all the cadets. And, um, you know, there's 139 squadrons involved. Each one probably did a whole bunch of science missions. So there's probably, you know, close to 500 science projects out there flying today. And uh, I got all the labels and everything ready to ship back. Um, we'll get them in the mail on Monday. So we got to get that back here to Central Central Command. All right, Jason, we're going to hang up on you all right. so you can eat in peace. And then we're going to go back right. and talk to our folks in Florida. Thanks so much. All right, thanks. All right, let's go get our group in Florida. Exciting times. We're almost done, folks. We are in the, the final phases here. Um, let me give uh, Florida a call. One second. All right, there we go. There is Florida back. Well, how exciting is this, everybody? We, we've got the airplanes in the air. We're tracking them. Let me get you guys live here. Um, we, we are tracking them right now. Um, we had two successful balloons. Colonel Joe, we got the 100,000 we were looking for. We got the 103, I think it was. Um, so very exciting. Any, any comments from you guys down in Florida watching this all? Well, it was exciting, of course. But let me say this, Bob. Uh, I was honored when Susan Millay asked me to be a part of this wonderful project. And I was also honored by the CAP several years ago when they named a CAP uh, or a squadron in Austin, Texas, called Colonel Joe Kittinger's uh, uh, patrol. But I'm, so I've been, I'm delighted to have be a part of this interesting experiment. Uh, and I'm, of course, delighted to be here with these uh, young CAP cadets. And uh, it's just been an exciting event. And Susan, you got to be congratulated for doing a great job. You, you, you were the ones that really made this happen. And uh, thank you so much, Susan, for uh, putting this all together. And Bob, you've done a great job as a master of ceremonies. I appreciate that. You know, I, I can't, um, you know, listen, I, I think that Susan likes to be behind the scenes and she, she likes to let other people kind of take the spotlight, so to speak. Um, you know, so I'm, gonna, I'm going to embarrass her a little bit. Um, and I think, Colonel Joe, you can help me with that. Um, Susan, so anybody doesn't know, so Susan is in charge of educational outreach um, and STEM activities here at Civil Air Patrol at the national level, right? So she works for Dr. Jeff Montgomery um, and she gets her authority and support from, from, from Dr. Montgomery. Um, but on top of that, Susan isn't somebody that sits in a cubicle in a room in Alabama. She is all over the country. She is constantly going to um, air shows, to um, you know, aviation symposiums, talking to the women in aviation forums. Um, you know, she is a retired uh, school principal, um, which I can tell you, if you don't do what you're supposed to do, 
you know, you, <laughs> you can get the principles there. Um, but she, you know, so we thank everybody at CAP and, you know, we thank you, Colonel Joe. We c this didn't happen without Susan. <sighs> Um, and again, I know she's in the background and she's probably like, oh my gosh, people stop talking about me. Go back to talking about the balloons. Um, but you know, from a CAP perspective, we, you know, you don't, if you are new to CAP, or if you're in, involved in AE, um, you know, in, at a local level, you may not know Susan's name, like the back of your hands. Um, but just, just understand that Susan is one of the, one of the best people we have at national. Um, just an incredible job. Any, Joe, anything else you want to add about that? No, I think you covered it well, Bob. Uh, but uh, we're, we're very much indebted to her. She's, she's dedicated to aerospace education and to the, the STEM program for these young cadets. And uh, she's a, a wonderful asset to our country and to our nation. She represents the best in aerospace education. She really does. She really does. And I will tell you, I, am, I love the, um, the, the, ex the extra work that she does with women in aviation as well. Um, she spends a lot of time on diversity in aviation, um, and that is something that we all can learn from. So, um, yeah, so Susan, everybody out there on the internet chat, give Susan a virtual clap for her. Um, great job, Susan. Um, this didn't happen without you. Um, all right, so Joe, we had a couple more questions. So folks, are, you know, usually we get out there and we, you know, people are saying, hey, you know, what about the balloons and where's the track of the balloons? So we got a little bit, we got a few more minutes to talk because what we're gonna do is we'll be wrapping up relatively soon. Um, right now we are tracking the airplane and the airplane is just doing, you know, donut after donut. So um, I'm waiting to see if they actually break off at some point because they're actually gonna go for the second balloon. Um, at some point here, but I think they're gonna try their best to try to find the first balloon. So because of that, there's really not a lot else to look at from the balloon perspectives. Um, they've gone up, they've gone down. Um, so we've got a little bit more time to talk. So we had a couple of questions that have come in since the last time we talked. So, you know, one of the ones that just came in is, what is your favorite airplane? Well, actually, let me ask that two questions. What's your favorite airplane? I'm gonna add on to this question. What's your favorite airplane that you've flown? And what's just your favorite airplane, whether you've flown it or not? Well, I have two favorite airplanes. The first one, the prop driven, was a P-51. I love that airplane. It was a unique, beautiful piece of machinery. And the second one was the F-4 Phantom. And I have over a thousand hours flying that airplane, flew it in combat. It was just a phenomenal airplane, and I thoroughly enjoyed it. But you know, I've flown 93 different types of airplanes, and I've enjoyed flying every one of them. Every one of them. If you can fly a Piper Cub, you can fly an F-4. It's, it's the same mechanics of making a piece of machinery do what you want to do, same as a Piper Cub or a 747. If you can fly one, you can fly the other. Just a little bit more instruments uh, and more pay uh, and more fuel that you burn. But uh, an airplane's an airplane. And uh, once you are part of this profession, uh, it, it's nothing to go from one airplane to another because you have the, the elements of flying a piece of machinery and make it go where you want it to go. So let me ask you about that, right? Because we have a lot of cadets that are watching today. Um, separate, you know, I, I, I'll, I don't know if you heard before, but we have several thousand now that are watching. Um, so really great turnout. So one of the questions that they may have, right? Maybe they've done an orientation ride, right? Where they've been in a Cessna 172, a Cessna 182, um, something along those lines. And they think to themselves, okay, I could see myself flying, or even the adults, because I could see myself flying a Cessna 182, but there is no way I could fly an F-35 or an F-22. So what, what is that progression, you know, that from say general aviation, single piston to say a jet? Like what, how much harder is it? Like what's the big differences? Well, the one thing we have today that we didn't have two years ago, they have wonderful simulators. And, and they learn an awful lot in the simulator. They, they learn the techniques, the procedures, uh, if you can fly a simulator, you 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 know that the airline pilots take their training on their new airplanes in a simulator, and their first flight is out of that simulator is in actually flying an airplane. That that's how that's how uh, precise these new simulators are. Uh, but you learn a lot by that. But what happens is you you start with a Piper Cub, and then you go up to a, a Cessna 182, and then you go to a, a twin engine airplane. And you, you, you get you progress uh, at more complexity, more instruments, more things to be concerned about. 
But an airplane is an airplane. What, what you can make it go where you want it to go, but it takes a lot of training, takes a lot of simulator time, takes like a check and we're looking at the tech order, and it takes a lot of study to do that. But uh, the basic elements of flying an airplane are the same. But it takes a lot of dedication, a lot of simulator time, a lot of personal interest in what you're doing to get where you can fly the better, more and more faster airplanes, more complicated aircraft. Yeah, I think it's interesting. Um, I have a good friend of mine who flies 747s, and she, um, uh, I'm trying to think if I should say her name here, because she has a YouTube channel too that folks should go check her out. Um, I'm not sure if CAP would want me to do that. Anyways, um, I'll do it anyways. Na Nancy Bradshaw. So, so anybody's interested, go check out Nancy Bradshaw. She's a very family-friendly oriented YouTube channel as well. Um, so I don't think it'd be a problem with CAP having me say that. Um, so she she flew for a while 747s, right? One of the biggest airplanes, you know, in the sky. Um, and she flew an older one. So not even like one of the, you know, ones with all the glass cockpits and everything else. And she said something I thought was interesting. She goes, she finds it easier to land a 747 than she does, you know, a Piper. <laughs> um, between all the systems on the airplane and the autopilots, and uh, she finds it easier, you know, to fly those than, than sometimes even the smaller planes. So, um, so I thought that was really interesting. Going back to your, going back to your initial, because one of the, I got this question twice. Um, can you give us kind of a feel for the size and the, I don't know about weight, but like the size of the capsule? that was under the balloon that you that you took up? Well, I made five high altitude balloon flights. Uh, two of them were in pressurized capsules and three of them were in un, uh, open, open gondolas. Uh, the first flight I made is, was to 97,000 feet on the uh, Manhai program. That was in 1957. And that capsule was three feet across and seven feet high very small confined because we knew when we went into space that the pilot was going to be in a very small confined area. So this total capsule with me and all the equipment on it weighed 1,400 pounds, which isn't very much. Uh, by comparison, the open gondola that I flew in with me and all the equipment weighed 1,100 pounds. And of course, the less weight you have, the higher you can go. So you want to keep the weight down as low as you can get it. The other aircraft I flew in was pressurized with, with a telescope on top. It's called Stargazer. And this was a pressurized gondola that had an atmosphere of 15,000 feet, which is common, but it was made by oxygen and helium uh, as, as the atmosphere. But that weighed uh, 2,800 pounds because it had a big telescope and, and a lot of equipment to do experiments with. But the, the, to answer your question, the, the gondola's weight was from 1,400 pounds to 2,800 pounds, depending upon the mission that, that was there. What happened, just out of, now this is my own curiosity, this wasn't a question online, but this is my curiosity, because what goes up comes down. So what happened to the parachute and gondola when it came back down? Well, when I jump, after I jump, the three jumps that I made, after I jump, and I'm safe on the ground, they send a radio command signal to the uh, system that cut away the balloon and then the parachute brought the gondola down and we use the same gondola on all three uh, jumps I made. So we use the same technique that we saw today where when the balloon burst, parachute inflated and brought the payload down. Same way on, my, on our flights. And thousands of balloon flights have been terminated that way, mostly by radio command to the cutaway system Cut away the balloon and down comes the parachute. Okay, so it came down under under a balloon, or I'm sorry, under a parachute. So it didn't just drop on somebody's house <laughs> at 700 miles an hour or something. <laughs> so that's good. Oh, not land any houses. Oh, that's true. That's true. Um, you have a. St I'm going to ask one more question from the internet here, but then then I also you had a story that I thought was really you had mentioned before that I think would be great for the folks here in case they hadn't heard it on our previous talk. Um, and the question online was, how long did it take you to fall from, you know, give or take 100,000 feet? Okay. Uh, on the, the jump from 100 and actually 102,800 feet, I free fell for four minutes and 37 seconds from the time I jumped out until the time the main parachute opened. Okay. Now, the main parachute, the main parachute opened at, at uh, 18,000 feet. Normally, you open lower than that, but there's two reasons why we, we use that altitude. 
first of all, the elevation at, at Alamogordo was 4,000 feet. So that meant I was looking at my parachute 14,000 feet above the ground. It was an experimental parachute. And if something went wrong, I wanted enough time to get my reserve parachute out. So that's the reason why I opened so high is in the interest of safety and uh, mainly saving my butt uh, by a reserve parachute. <laughs> Very good. Now, now, actually, that dives into the question I was going to ask you. You had told a story about when you, you may have mentioned it kind of before, too, or alluded to it. When you first jumped, um, not the one where you were kind of spinning, but when you got a chance, you, you rolled off on your back, and you looked at the, um, the gondola, and you, you said, you, I'll tell you, let you tell the story, but you were like, you thought you, like, you were holding steady in space, and the gondola was climbing away from you. Can you tell us that story? That's a great story. Well, when, when I jumped after about 15 seconds, I, I, I wanted to see, I just wanted to see what the balloon looked like. So I rolled over my back, and I looked up. And, and by the way, the balloon was, was 200 feet across, the, the diameter of the balloon and altitude. Right, was, so it's pretty big. So anyway, I looked up, and the balloon looked like it was shooting into space, where actually I was going like butt out of hell, and the balloon was sta stationary. So, but how can you tell? I mean, you, you, one, one or the other, either the balloon's going up or you're going down. Well, I knew I was going down because gravity is a law. Right. <laughs> yeah, you, can't, you can't battle gravity. <laughs> it's going to win. Um, quick update for you all. It looks like air, the aircraft has completed its search um, profile of balloon one, and it is now heading to Greenfield, Indiana, to go help the search for balloon two. Um, so we definitely got some progress there. Um, Colonel Joe, was there any other questions? And this is actually for everybody in Florida. Um, is there any other questions there in the room for Colonel Joe? Uh, I actually have a sir. So you've lived 93 years now? Yes. So are there any things in your life that you regret not trying or not doing? Well, I never wrestled a shark. <laughs> Does somebody have a no, boat? I've had a, I've had a wonderful <laughs> life, uh, a life full of adventure. Uh, I flew across the Atlantic Ocean uh, from Maine to Italy just for the fun of it, just for an adventure. And I set four world records that will be there for a long, long time. But I did that just for the adventure of it. The flights that I did in the Air Force, were, there, were, there was a specific reason for it. There was a reason for research that we needed. So there was a big difference between flying the Atlantic for fun and versus the work that I did in the Research and Development Command uh, and in the Air Force. Uh, I was so fortunate because I was in the right place at the right time and always had a wonderful team of people. And also I worked for a visionary. This man was named Dr. John Paul Stepp. John Stepp was a man who rode a rocket sled to 600 miles an hour. Uh, he, is, he was a visionary. He knew we were going into space back in the early 50s. Uh, he, was a, he knew that, and he knew that there were certain things that we needed to obtain. And everything I did in the Air Force and research was because of Dr. Stapp. He gave me the tools and the team and support that I needed. But without him, he was like Susan Millay. She's behind the scenes, but she made things happen. Well, Dr. Stapp was the same way. He gave me the opportunity and I had a, always had a great team that worked with me. Uh, and that's, that's the, the, the fun that I had and the research that I accomplished was because of Dr. Stapp and uh, his uh, vision. And he was a one, he's probably 0.1% of the, of the scientific community that believed we're going to go into space. Space in 1950 was Buck Rogers. That was something we would never do. Nobody could ever imagine we were going to walk on the moon. But when you think about it in our lifetime, all the wonderful things that have happened uh, in a short period of time, and think 100 years from now, where we're going to look back and say, boy, they thought walking on the moon was something. What we've done today was, you know, far superior to that. But time marches on. We learn more, uh, and the world profits from it. Yeah, that's awesome. You know, it, it is amazing to think, you know, a couple things. One, the Wright brothers. I mean, that was only a, a little over 100 years ago. I mean, think about, you know, not, not that war is a good thing, right? But war, war breeds invention or whatever, however that saying is. 
I mean, you know, the jet, the jet fighters started, you know, at the end of World War II. Uh, we, we went from, uh, in, in a span of 20 years, you know, two bicycle makers learning how to fly something that got eight feet off the ground um, for, you know, a couple of minutes at a time, um, you know, to biplanes in World War I um, that, you know, were stitched together with fabric and tape. Um, you know, and then, you know, then moving to World War II, where high performance engines, so, um, you know, um, rotary engines, you talk about the P-51, what, a, what an amazing, the Spitfire, the P-51, what amazing aircraft those were for their time. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm so jealous of you. I, to be honest with you, I'm, I'm almost more jealous of you for the flying a P-51 than I am. <laughs> I'm six foot eight. I ain't getting into a, a, a P-51. Um, and um, and you know, then you talk about, you know, your generation for space um, coming out of World War II, uh, you know, because literally space was a battlefield. It was a battlefield between nations to see who could do what the fastest and whose science could expand. Um, and so, you know, education and, and technology, um, super valuable during that time. But, but, you know, people think about Buzz, you know, Buzz Aldrin and Neil Armstrong and, you know, the work that you guys did, um, and again, I, you know, I say you, but it, it, like you say before, it's a team. So that the work that entire team did set the groundwork. Without your teams, there was no Mercury program. There was no Apollo program. Um, we didn't know if the, the space suits would even work in space until you went. So very cool stuff. Uh, for anybody um, that, uh, I'm going to sound like I'm wrapping up, and I'm not, but just, I just want to point this out before we move on. Um, Colonel Joe has done so much more than we have talked about here, right? So, um, and unfortunately, I mean, honestly, dude, I could talk to you for, you know, years um, and not even touch the surface of things I want to talk to you about. Um, so rather than fanboy out, I, I, I do think that folks should go take a look at what Colonel Joe has done. Um, he, he, again, he's done stuff that we haven't even talked about that if any of us did in our lifetimes, it would be a lifetime achievement by itself. Um, all right. So any other questions from Florida? Oh, yes, sir. Um, I was curious what aircraft you first soloed in, uh, the first time you soloed. Uh, Piper Cub. And I think probably 50% uh, today and 100% in my day, that was the first airplane that, that we flew. Mm -hmm. And it was a tailwheel airplane. And all of us aviators love tailwheel airplanes. That, that's real airplane flying the tailwheels. So. Very sweet. Other questions in Florida? All right. I think we had, um, I think I had one more question online. Let me see if I can find it again. Um, okay. So this was about uh, Dr. Stapp. Um, let's see here. But that's not really a question. It was just more information. Um, all right. So the autobiography, Colonel Joe, come up and get me. I've heard that's incredible. I, I will tell you, I'm about two thirds of the way through it. So nobody spoil the ending for me. <laughs> um, let's see. All right. So Colonel Joe, we're going to head back over to, because I now see them, I, I see the aircraft circling around the second location. We're going to head back to, um, to wrap up with Indiana. Uh, but I wanted to give you the final word from Florida. Anything that you wanted to talk about or, or any comments for the team as we wrap up in Florida? Well, once again, I just want to thank Susan for inviting me to be a part of this wonderful program. And what a pleasure it was for me to meet these CAP cadets and know that they are the future leaders of our country and that the, the work that the, that the aerospace uh, industry gets from the CAP program and the STEM program is invaluable. And these are the future leaders of our country. Absolutely. Closing, my, my book has come up and get me. Uh, it's, it's interesting and uh, it does have an ending to it. And the, the writer is, was successful. <laughs> <laughs> All right, very good. All right, so last call. Any other questions for Colonel Joe, either on the internet or down in Florida? Because then we're going to let them go and enjoy the rest. Colonel Joe now needs to go find somebody, take him out in a boat so he can go wrestle a shark. That's what I heard yeah. from this whole thing. <laughs> All right, I think that you guys are set. So first of all, Colonel Joe, thank you personally um, for everything you've done 
uh, you know, I've had a chance now a couple times to talk to you, and I really am looking forward to this uh, whole COVID thing getting out of our way so I can get down there and shake your hand in person. Um, I know Susan's looking forward to that as well. So as soon as we can make that happen, we're going to do it. One final thing, Bob. Yes. I'm looking forward to the day when I meet the people that put up the winning prize winning experiment because we're going to give them that beautiful trophy and I'm looking forward to meeting them and I hope there's a lot of CAP cadets there with me to congratulate the winner of 650 different scientific experiments awesome. that went up with those two balloons today. Absolutely awesome. Absolutely. Yeah, we've got to um, we've we've got to get this COVID thing to come back down. But I know that uh, in just a couple of weeks, um, I can tell you, I've already been looking at the video submissions um, and I'm not going to give any of you a hint, but I've already got a couple of squadrons that I'm, I'm leaning towards. So we're going to see how you're uh, I've looked at the patches. I've been looking at your 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 science projects. Um, so go out there, do a great job with your post analysis. Um, there, there's definitely a couple of you that are in the running, um, and it's pretty exciting. So as Colonel Joe said, you know, we, we want to try to get uh, these cadets, if, if, if time allows, we can get them down there to you, and, and I think that that's going to be awesome. So I would love for you to be able to hand them that cup on person. So with that, uh, Florida and Colonel Joe, thank you so much for your time. And actually, I've got a call coming in from Michael Austin, or Austin Michael, I always say it backwards. Um, and uh, so he may have, he may be calling me, telling me that they have the first, uh, the first balloon. So we're gonna let you guys go. Thank you so much. And uh, you know, good luck with the wrestling of the, the shark. I want video of that too. So, <laughs> all right, thank you, Florida. We'll talk to you soon, bye-bye. Yep. All right. Hang on. Hang on. We, we're going to get you on the, the, the thing here. Let me get back over to this. All right. Uh, actually, I don't even, nobody wants to see me. <laughs> hang on. Let's go over here. All right. We are back on. It, it, I apologize. Is it Austin Michael or is it Michael Austin? Michael Austin. Michael Austin. Okay. Well, Austin's the last name. All right. Thank you so much. All right. Michael, what do you got for us? Well, sir, we have uh, retrieved the contents from balloon number one. Woo I've got it in my vehicle. I'm about uh, 15 to 20 minutes from uh, arriving at APA. As soon as I get there, Jason and I will get some pictures to you, lickety-split, so that we can see what the, uh, the contents looked like after impact uh, of the ground. And then we'll start going through the process of sorting those out getting them back in the envelopes so that hopefully we get them out in the mail tonight and get them back to the units as uh, quickly as possible. Uh, tell us a little bit through your eyes, what was the terrain like where it landed? We were extremely fortunate in where the, uh, the weather balloon contents landed. It was actually a soybean crested up on a, uh, a little elevation uh, in the country. There's, uh, it was surrounded by uh, a wooded area that was a, uh, uh, a summer camp uh, for kids. And uh, it was very close to a fork in a river. So we had some good landmarks. And uh, I will tell you, for the first time I've watched a, uh, a rescue mission, uh, they did a superb job. It was there was no fiddling around and you do this. They all knew what they did was going to do the instant they got out of the van. Uh, things went into action. I think last time I talked to you, I, uh, I kind of played through how the drone operation went. But it was so instrumental to watch the aircraft in the sky communicate uh, with the team on the ground and how they deployed themselves. Uh, and once the drone had located it, it appeared to me that the ground crew then went and navigated the terrain uh, and then came back with the payload. And then there's an entire process that goes on there, communication with the aircraft to, to uh, probably go search for the next uh, weather balloon contents. Uh, they record, they document, and then at that point in time, we were able to uh, uh, secure the load for me to take it back to APA. But but a very, very smooth operation. Uh, the landowner and his wife 
were out there the entire time. They were extremely impressed with the professionalism of the of the crew. They presented their credentials and gave them a background history of what it was that we were doing, and they were very comfortable with that. Uh, so it was a really neat operation to watch. I love it. I love it when, as, as the uh, Mission Impossible uh, statement, I think is right, uh, I love it when a plan comes together. It was at the A-team. <laughs> um, but... Bob, what I'll tell you about that operation is that it wasn't just the seniors running the operation, that the, the cadets, uh, meaning the, the younger uh, ones of the group, I mean, they were extremely instrumental in what they were doing and very proficient at what they were doing. So it was a very cohesive team of both seniors as well as the cadets that was part of that uh, mission to, uh, to locate and secure those contents. Awesome. Yeah, and we can see the, um, the, set, the air crew has gone to the second location and they've been circling now for a few minutes. So that's pretty great. So maybe they've got their eyes on it there. It seems like they've they've locked I, in pretty good over there. Um, awesome. I know the last time that I looked at that location, I'm just hopeful that it, it got somewhere away from uh, the traffic in the in the city area there. So we're going to kind of keep our fingers crossed on that one. Yeah, it does seem like um, if it's where they're circling, it does seem like it could be in a residential track. Um, so hopefully it's not on somebody's roof. But, um, but it does look like it went to the west of Greenfield uh, based on the aircraft track. So, all right, cool deal. All right, well, we're gonna let you do your thing. Um, I'm gonna go and get back to uh, uh, Jason. If you're out there, I'm gonna call you back in just a second. Um, thanks again. And uh, if you can give my thanks to everybody out in the ground teams there, Michael, I appreciate it. I sure will, and we'll talk to you later. Thanks, Michael, you have a great day. Bye, YouTube. Bye. All right, that was Michael. We have successfully retrieved the first package. Hooray. Let me give uh, Jason a call. I'll be right back with you. All right, All right. we got Jason back. Can you hear me? We can. How are you? Great. Did you get the news? We got the first package. Okay, awesome. That is great news. Yep, we got the first package and the aircraft is circling around the coordinates around the second package. I'm not sure if they have uh, sighting of it yet, but they're they're okay. doing they're not doing a search grid over there. They're like they did the first time where it looked like they were looking for it. They're they're doing a pretty a pretty good circle pattern. So, I think that they probably have it. Uh, okay. based on cool. what I'm seeing. I could be seeing this wrong, but um, it seems like, you know, that that's a pretty good circular pattern. Um, so I bet you they got some pretty good eyes on it. Um, and I'm guessing the ground team is probably, they weren't too far away. Um, you know, it was probably 15 minutes away. Yeah. Yeah, they're going to go from, um, I'm not even sure what town this is. But yeah, yeah, they don't seem like they're too far away. Um so I do want to say this. So I do have, I, I, just for the in, folks on the internet, we still have a large number of people on the internet watching through us, and that's awesome. Um, and, you know, Jason, thank you for everything you're doing today. Um, we couldn't do this without you, you know, without your oh, expertise. Thanks. Um, so it's huge. So if people wanted to, you know, I did my sales pitch for my, uh, for YouTube channel, right, for AE. So tell us a little bit about Stratostar. What, what type of work you're doing? How can people find out about you? Sure, yeah. I mean, the best way is to go to stratostar.com, and uh, that's our website. You can see all kinds of information. Did you pick it up, actually? All right, I just got news that they picked up uh, payload number two. Woo! -hoo! So, uh, Successful day. you know, you might have to end your stream early. I don't know. I mean, uh, that's kind of unbelievable. Awesome. All right. Now, Man, guys, so, I mean, so we got the dream team here. We got aircraft, we got ground crews, they're trained, we got walkie talkies. It's not, we're making it look a little too easy right. for the internet. Uh, I'm going to say that it's, it's, uh, this is a challenging kind of an endeavor. Um, if you know what geocaching is, this is like geocaching extreme, um, going out there and trying to find these things. So we're making it a little bit uh, too easy on the internet. But uh, yeah, anyways, uh, if you guys check out our website, stratostar.com, 
S T R A T O S T A R dot com. Um, you can learn a little bit more about us. We actually have a uh, ebook on high altitude ballooning for education. You can check that out. Um, if you would like to fly a payload on a mission, uh, on the front page you're going to see a little link that says Share Mission. And um, if you click on that, you'll be able to see um, the next upcoming share missions. And you can actually buy a spot for with the capsule and everything. If you're going to do it for your classroom, if you want to do it for your school or something, you can buy a whole bunch more. Um, and if you're, you know, a big education organization like this, maybe we could do a, a cap launch for you guys as well. Like for share, you know, we'll see. And hopefully we do this again, Captain Bob. Um, <laughs> We'll see what Susan and everybody else thinks. Uh, I know that uh, I'm excited to get these projects back in the hands of students and, and get their results. And, uh, you know, we're going to have the award ceremony, and I think uh, we'll be able to share a lot more results coming up. So, um, you know, I, why don't you plug that, too? Yeah, so um, we, as I mentioned kind of earlier uh, in, in the live stream, we have mul there's lots of videos and first of all this isn't like the first video that we've done right so you know the other two videos talking about what stratostar is or not your company i'm sorry but the um the high altitude balloon challenge you know, we did lessons for a aeos that's not as valuable now for you to watch because you know you're kind of getting it here but we did an over hour long interview specifically with colonel joe um, really got more in the details of, of, of what he's done. A lot of that you heard today as well. But, um, you know, I'd recommend if you've got the time, um, you know, share that video um, of Colonel Joe. Um, you know, he is, he is a legend in our, in our, in our community. Um, and then going forward, we have several videos. So sometime, I know Jason probably wants it to happen within 35 seconds of me closing the live stream, but at some point, <laughs> but it's, um, but at some point, you know, relatively soon, day, two days, three days, um, you'll get a quick little recap video. Um, this is going to be a super fast one. It's not going to be like super polished, but it's going to be, it's going to give you a little bit of a taste of what you didn't see, um, you know, from the, the ground teams and some of the footage from the balloon. And then, uh, then after that, um, there's going to be a more after we get all of um, all of the, the all of the sorry, all the kids go back to the squadrons. One of the things that they have to do is they have to do a post video in order to be, still be in the the running for the five thousand dollars. And think about it, the, you, the cap squadrons, five thousand dollars. Think about what you could do for five thousand um, dollars. So, like I said. Uh, Jason, I, I went through a good portion of those um, those videos already, and I got my eye on eight squadrons. I'm not going to say who they are, but um, all right. I, I almost kind of want to email them and say, hey, you know, go all out on this post thing because you're in the running for that five. So you, J you Susan, and me have to talk about it, whether or not we want to let, let those eight, who I consider the top eight. Well, you know what? Here's what I was thinking, Bob. Uh, you know, maybe the other teams – because that was the first run. Uh, maybe yep. the other teams, you give them a little feedback. Maybe they kick it up a notch. And, uh, you know, we get some more submissions and follow the directions. I think that they can do it. Everybody's doing TikTok. Yep. This is TikTok for science, okay? <laughs> right. And you know what? Honestly, all you guys listening, to be able to communicate online like this, um, to be able to do science and projects across the country. I've never even met Captain Bob in person. Um, we that. have completely worked on this <laughs> virtually. Uh, Susan, I met once or twice in person, and this whole thing has been done online. Your communications, just like when we were growing up writing a paper, we didn't have typewriters. We did have computers, but um, they're like writing is so important, and it, it is vital. But being able to put your information in a video for science, for you know, communicating um, to, to businesses or you know, whatever you're doing is vital. So I think that the other groups can kick it up another yeah. notch. Agreed. Um, two things, and then we're going to start wrapping up here. Um, number one, uh, talking about – oh, actually, I want to go back to the, the, the videos. Um, you get bonus points if you make me laugh out loud. Um, I don't remember, and I apologize. I should have wrote this down. Um, and then, because I'm live streaming, I can't go look for it now. But um, – I, I was watching videos at like 1.30 in the morning when I was still trying to get some of the technology working at my desk here. Um, one of the videos I saw, uh, and if, if you're online, say, hey, that was us, and I'll, I'll give you a call out you know, live here. Um, 
there was a female cadet and she was inside of a house um and she i think she was in uniform i i might be wrong about that and she was talking about how much her squadron is like a family right so it's this nice heartwarming story and then she's standing in front of a window and there's two cadets in the back of the window arguing with each other. <laughs> it's like a family. <laughs> so, um, and they, they kind of built onto that. And so that was inventive. Um, it, it made me laugh. Um, you know, it wasn't necessarily tied into the science per se. Um, but anyways, I enjoyed the, uh, enjoying the artisticness of that. Uh, all right, so going forward as we wrap up here, um, we're gonna have that short little video and then we're gonna have a longer, more polished video uh, once we get the video back from the Air Force when they clear the video that we can use for it. Um, we're gonna have that. We are gonna have probably around the same time, maybe even slightly before, um, we're gonna try to get this, um, it's probably gonna be a huge file, um, but the, the, the video from the balloons, uh, I'm gonna try to put up that whole hour, hour and a half it's gonna be, two hours almost. Um, video, I'll put some nice music behind it. We'll do a little jazz music, you know? Um, <laughs> so you can watch it um, on your screen, watch it go up and come back down um, as it happened. I think that'll be really kind of cool. Uh, it didn't seem like it was spinning very much, so I think it's actually gonna be pretty nice oh, to watch. Oh, you just wait. Oh, is you it gonna be spinning? You just wait. Yeah. When, uh, I, you know, we'll, we'll put it up so everybody can see, but uh, it's intense yeah. at certain points. Um, you know, if you get motion sick, you know, close your eyes. It, it <laughs> might need to come with a warning on it. Yeah, don't, Bob. Don't, don't do it in VR. And then, um, and then the fourth video is going to be, um, it's going to be the awards ceremony. We are still very much up in the air with that. Um, obviously, everybody in the nation knows what's going on um, with COVID. Um, Florida is especially getting hit hard right now with it. And um, so we're gonna have to kind of play with that a little bit to see the best that we can do. Um, CAP, we're not allowed to have um, activities like you know Susan, myself, um, we're kind of locked out um, unless there's an emergency for some reason um, from going in there. So, so we, we, we're hopefully hoping that you know we'll see a trend come back down and, and we'll allow for that to happen. But regardless, we will have an awards ceremony. Um, whatever that looks like. And our biggest hope is that we can get down there. I would love for at least, um, you know, uh, maybe it's the cadet commander or at somebody, I don't think, you know, if the winning squadron has a hundred kids in it. I don't think we can put a hundred kids on airplanes and fly them to Florida. But, you know, hopefully, you know, we can get at least, you know, one or two cadet commanders, um, get them down there. I would love for Joe, Colonel Joe, to be able to hand that first wow. trophy to them personally, that that's what I want. Um, is it too late to join Captain Bob? I, I'd like to put my not. hat in the ring to get a trophy from uh, Colonel Joe. You know what, you have people around you in that building that can help you sign up. I'm sure there's probably a, a <laughs> form that you could sign today, Jason, so. <laughs> it's past the uh, deadlines though. <laughs> oh man, but that Jason, is awesome. you got next year, um, Jason. And you know what, for my personal squadron in Greenville, you're all probably wondering, why, you know, where are we? You know, and Jason's like, yeah, where are you? I sent Bob your stuff, right? We can't win this thing, you know? I mean, could you imagine, you know, if, if I say, well, the winner is me. <laughs> so so we, we are going to hopefully, again, once COVID kind of lets go of us a little bit in South Carolina, we're gonna be doing this thing for, as well. We won't be doing this part of the bigger challenge, but we're gonna be doing this whole mission profile. Super excited to be able to do that in South Carolina. Um, this idea for this mission profile actually came from the mission profile I built for South Carolina. Um, so, so super excited to be able to do that. So we now have both of the packages that are in our hands. So uh, we didn't have to, at least we didn't hear about anybody having to climb on somebody's roof to get the thing off somebody's roof. Cause it did look like it landed in a more of a, um, a residential area. Um, so I'm gonna be super excited to hear how that worked out. Um, but Jason, is there any parting words as we wrap up from you? You know, uh, I'm just really thankful to uh, be a part of this. And again, like Susan said um, yesterday in one of our meetings, you know, this was just an idea, you know, it just bounced it between a couple people. I bounced it to Susan, she, she, you know, I, and I saw Captain Bob's channel. I didn't know anything about him, but I said, you know, I think YouTube would be cool to have involved. And, um, you know, we, we all saw that uh, it could be 
something that students could get involved in with uh, COVID and hands-on and STEM kind of getting shut down, um, that uh, we could align aerospace, hands-on, you know, space. We got Space Force coming up. Mm -hmm. I don't know if we talked about that today, but a big part of uh, United States military. Um, and it all kind of came together to give students an experience um, that is end-to-end -end launch. This is the same thing that NASA, SpaceX does, coming up with ideas and projects and then flying it and seeing what happens. And I will say to all the cadets listening, um, if you get an unexpected result, that's science, okay? That doesn't mean it was a failure. If it doesn't do what you thought it was going to do, you actually learn more. Um, than kind of confirming your biases. And so even if you got no results, it is information. Just like Edison, he said, you know, I did, what was it like? I learned 1,000 ways not to make a light bulb. <laughs> right. And in that process, he learned, and, and society and everything learned so much. Um, and, and now we have light and, you know, electricity. What we don't talk about in that is through the process of trying to create light, he invented the incomplete electric grid. End to end, there was nothing. He had to figure out switches for the wall and everything else. So I, I just want to encourage you that if some of your projects had no result or a weird result, it just means that there's another step in the process that we need to continue to go. And everything you've done is a mystery. You can't Google the things that you guys did. And anybody that's listening, you know, I'd love to fly and launch with you guys as well. We can do a share mission. Um, you know, go to stratastar.com and check it out. And I'm just so thankful for CAP and uh, all the resources and uh, just this entire experience has just blown me away. So I'm just really blessed. Awesome deal, man. Well, hey, listen, I can't ask for more. And if I keep talking, I'm just going to be pontificating, uh, which right, I've known to will do. Will they be able to find um, you know, the videos you talked about that we're going to release on your channel here? Yeah. So um, again, I'm, I'm trying not to be an over salesman on myself. We know like the YouTubers do, but um, really the best way to do it is to hit that subscribe button, um, hit the bell icon. Um, I promise not to give you content that's not you know related to the work that we do here at CAP and AE. Um, you know, so so do hit do that. Um, and then again, that just from a YouTube perspective and a Google perspective, that helps broaden that reach out. Um, so if you haven't already, um, if you give a like to this video, more people are going to see it. If you subscribe, more people will get the channel. Um, it's a huge benefit. So yeah, so thanks for bringing that up. Um, all right, I think that is pretty much it. I'm sure that once I disconnect, I'm going to go, oh, I forgot that one more thing I should have said. Well, I tell you what, do you have a, um, you know, I, I have a Twitter. It's Stratostar, the number four and the letter U. And um, if I am able to get a picture or some pictures up, I'll do that. Um, there you go. And so we got your your information. And um, I'm going to try to grab a, a couple screenshots. I'll also kind of um, uh, message uh, CAP headquarters because I think they sent something out. Um, but yeah, so check our Twitter feeds tonight. We'll be able to you know put out hopefully some pictures of uh from the flight footage and uh yeah we'll, we'll we'll try to start cutting down this video we got hundreds of gigs coming our way right now <laughs> my computer's already afraid um all right yeah and, and you know to jason's point um you know for for me th these are the other things right so on twitter um you can find me at aerospace underscore live you got to put the underscore there um the youtube you're, you're you're there now this is this is what you're seeing unless you're finding me on facebook we do we are on other media platforms also but uh, they're being spread from youtube so you know youtube is where it starts at for me so uh youtube.com slash robert roberts um if you go there you're gonna find that we actually have a lot of interviews and we have a lot of really awesome interviews with with astronauts um with lots of great pioneers in aviation current um you know aviation people um and we we do put those up as podcasts um and so you can find the podcast at aerospace dash live so if you go to your favorite podcast thing if you do a search for aerospace dash live you'll find it there and as we wrap up i want to give credit to where credit is due we talk about the team this is you know strato star is part for today jason you are part of the team at cap um but if you think that what you saw 
is really cool you are not a cap member you're either a parent maybe you've got a, a youngster that you might ha be interested in this oh, um and jason. if you have um i'm gonna mute you just real quick jason and um if or if you're a senior member maybe you want to get involved in this please visit go civil and you'll find tons of information there. Um, we do, we are, you know, a hidden, a hidden gem. Um, but we have a lot of people, tens and tens of thousands of people. I think it's something like sixty thousand people or something like that. Um, so we're a large group, largest single-engine aircraft, um, you know, group in the world. Um, like I said, don't tell Canada. I think we could take them. Um, could drop, you know, water balloons out of the, the Cessnas. Um, so anyways, with that, hey, I am Captain going Bob. to wrap up. Yeah, Jason, go for it. Can you hear us? We got a special treat. Turn on my it. feet again. All right. You're on. Oh, do we got one? Come on over. This is our, our buddy, Mike. Yay. And I uh, here, grab what, what, we, what you just dropped off. So, so that people here get, it so is, people guys. Don't know. Mike has been huge for helping Indiana. We got it. Nice. I thought they'd be breaking oh, apart more. That, that actually it's all good. tangled up. It all twisted up. But here's the GoPro. This kind of got broken. Here's a GoPro. GoPro. Um, look at all your cadet projects. They're kind of a mess. I hope we didn't <laughs> lose any out the sides. This is number one, right? Correct. Okay. Cool. So this was in the middle. I think this got squished by all the other packages. Here's the other one. Very cool. And they're all jumbled up. So we're going to take that apart. What You got the balloon there? Show them what's left. That's it. That's it. <laughs> That's what's left. That is awesome. So all right. we'll, we'll leave it with that. We've got a lot of work to do here to get all this stuff organized and shipped out. I got all these envelopes stacked up. And we're going to try to get it in the mail on Monday. Michael, I can't imagine a better way to end the live stream than to have you show up with the package. That that literally was made for for TV moment right there. That was awesome. <laughs> there you go. Well, we're here to please, and it's been a great day. <laughs> and thanks so much for uh, – this is Michael's uh, school that we're here at, and uh, he volunteered it. So we were able to use the field and everything, and he took all the calls and made everything happen here. So thanks so much. No problem. Appreciate it. Yes, thank you. All right, you. we got to dig into this. All right, we're going to let you guys. We'll talk to you later. We're, we're done with the live stream, but they're not done on site because they still got to repackage all the stuff and get the stuff back. So with that, I'm going to kick over to me. Bye, Jason. Bye, Michael. All right, see ya. All right, let's kick off of you guys. And we're going to click back to me. All right, ladies and gentlemen, that's it. That is our very first 2021 High Altitude Balloon Challenge launch. And retrieval, we got them back. Very cool. Um, I, I'm not going to keep going because I'll talk for a few more hours if you let me. Um, so I want to say thank you to everybody involved. I want to say thank you. Uh, first of all, the you know the gentleman you just saw, uh, Michael Austin. Uh, I want to give him a special shout out. He's called me a couple times and really helped to organize things on site made it easy for the rest of the CAP team to come in. Um, if Michael wasn't there doing what he did, this, this honestly, we didn't give these folks very much time. By the time we got this thing approved through um, national levels and the Air Force, they had like two and a half weeks, um, which isn't a lot of time to put something like this together. So, th so between Michael getting you know the local stuff ramped up and um, she was in the background, but Lieutenant Colonel Griffith, she is our incident commander. Um, she was leading in, in the background, so to speak, um, this entire mission and helping to coordinate all the different teams. Um, she was also huge over the last two weeks of helping to uh, communicate with everybody, get everything lined up there in Indiana. There was no possible way that Jason, Susan, or myself could have made that work um, if it wasn't for, for those folks. Um, there's too many other folks for me to mention, um, but th those were some of the super, super, superstars. So with that, thank you very much, everybody. Um, and I hope that you'll get a chance to see the next content that's coming out. Um, with that, we're going to wrap up. I'm going to hang out on the chat online for a few more minutes, um, but we're going to end the video stream now. So thanks, everybody.